morning. This is the January 18th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is uh, Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the City Council President, and I'll be presiding tonight. We begin with a period of public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. We ask only you keep it to three minutes or less. And the other rule is uh, we're prohibited by our rules from exchanging, and uh, um, going in a back and forth exchange with you. This is your time to give your opinion to the City Council. And the reason for these things is basically to make sure that everyone uh, is heard fairly and receives equal time. So that being said, I'll go to the sign-up sheet. And the first person is uh, Virginia Irvine. And if you would come to the podium and please give your name and address for the record. And the floor is yours. My name is Virginia Irvine. I live at 32 Crab Island. Uh, I am a board member of the organization WinWise Massachusetts. Uh, this is an organization <laughs> that is a nonprofit organization that uh, gives support to people that have been harmed by wind turbines in Massachusetts, industrial wind turbines we're talking here. So uh, the <clears throat> I wanted to speak on your resolution uh, for 100% uh, renewable energy. And um, first of all, I'd like to say that your, your development of the pedestrian and the bike trail is incredible. I use it all the time. I walk 20, 25 miles a week. And, so, and part of that's into Florence on the bike trail, and the other thing is coming down here to Northampton on the bike trail. Um, so um, <clears throat> getting into the uh, whereases <laughs> in the resolution, uh, the, the um, disadvantage that are put on uh, local control and those sorts of things. I'd just like to say that coming from a small town that the facilities, the wind facilities in Massachusetts have been put in small rural communities. And uh, so those people are not normally thought of as a disadvantaged people. Um, your second whereas is that Northampton, that the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton can get 100% of the energy by har harnessing abundant <coughs> solar and wind resources. You have no wind resources here in the valley. And unless you have wind resources and you have wind developers knocking it on your, on, on your uh, mayor's door, you're not going to know anything about it. And it does look out at these beautiful machines that are creating electricity. But believe me, if you live near one of these machines, some people have had to abandon their homes and uh, because of the noise, because of the other emissions, infrasound, um, and I don't have time to go into any more. but. Um, that's uh, the law in Massachusetts states that noise is a contaminant, a, a air pollution contaminant, and therefore we've been able to work on that. Thank you very much. And the next person is Irvine Sobelman. Hi. Hello. My name is Irvine Sobelman. And I live at 116 Laurel Park here in Northampton. I am a member of Climate Action Now, which is a local grassroots group dedicated to preserving a livable planet and creating a more just society. I'm standing here today in support of the resolution calling for 100% renewable energy. Uh, personally, I'm a believer in the public trust doctrine which requires that vital natural resources on which human well-being depends 
must be cared for by our governments for the benefit of all present and future generations. <coughs> and that includes our water, our soil, our air, and significantly our climate, all currently at risk due to our fossil fuel driven energy system. So this resolution that is before you this evening sends a message to our state legislature that we support the statewide bill currently under consideration that mandates 100% renewables in the electrical sector by 2035 and in all sectors by 2050, as well as uh, some other building requirements, net zero for newly constructed buildings by 2030. Importantly, it also includes equitable access and green jobs jo and job training for environmental justice communities and displaced workers included in that as well. This resolution also states an intention for Northampton to set a goal of 100% renewable energy, not just to support the legislature in Boston. Joining six other Massachusetts municipalities that have already adopted similar commitments. Amherst, Leverett, Cambridge, Framingham, Salem, and Lowell. And nationwide, nearly 50 cities have adopted similar resolutions and commitments, as did 150 mayors at the US Conference of Mayors in June. So Northampton would be in good company. Let's encourage our state legislature to do the right thing, and let's take the lead here in Northampton. Thank you very much. Uh, the next person is Sharon Moulton, please. Ms. Moulton, please. I'm Sharon Moulton, Ward 7, 48 Evergreen Road, and I'm speaking as part of the Climate Action Now Northampton 100% Renewable Team. Irvine just presented some important points about the resolution, and I'm going to add a couple more. The resolution states an intention for Northampton to explore, to study, the possibility of establishing a community choice energy entity that could not only negotiate for competitive electricity rates for Northampton residents, businesses, and industries, but also develop a comprehensive energy plan that would develop, that would help us reduce our energy demand through strategic increases in both energy efficiency and local renewable energy generation. The resolution proposes that Northampton conduct this exploration in conjunction with some interested nearby communities, at least one of which has already passed a similar resolution. The exploration would seek information about both the benefits and the challenges for forming such an entity. This entity would be an innovative model that's been very successful in other states and has been implemented also on Cape Cod. It's time to show leadership in pursuing this model for the Pioneer Valley. <coughs> Studies I've read about how we can achieve 100% renewable energy use talk about moving to the use of electricity for, for power for all sources of energy and to have that electricity generated from 100% renewable resources. <coughs> Northampton can be a leader in taking steps to promote that possibility. As a regular representative of, of the public at Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission meetings, I also see the passage of this resolution and the commencement of the study about creation of a community choice energy entity as a great step in the direction of our forming a new sustainable Northampton plan. There are other people who are here in support, but not everyone wants to talk. So I'm now going to ask that people that are here in support, please stand up. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to not just stand, but in fact come up and talk, please? <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Partan. I live at 51 Summer Street in Ward 1. Um, and I am a faculty member at Hampshire College where I teach on climate change and other issues. And I also am a 
volunteer for Mothers Out Front, which is a group that, of parents that is banding together to try and uh, protect the environment for our children. And I'm a mother, I have a nine-year-old, and I really want her to be able to grow up in a semi-normal life and as far as our human condition on this planet. And the climate is changing really quickly, faster than any climate models predict of the climate scientists that we've got, the best climate scientists we have. And I just urge you to do something about it and to do as much as you can about it because this is the time we got to do something now. This is this is the time to do it. Thank you so much for taking this resolution up. And, and thank you. Um, is there anyone else who would like to provide public comment this evening before we start? If not, then we will uh, convene. And I'd ask the role of the city council, please. <coughs> Councilor Bidwell. Here. Present. Here. Here. <coughs> Present. Here. 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 Thank you very much. We are convened. Uh, let me first announce a public hearing um, about a petition to install an underground conduit at 23 <coughs> Atwood Drive. Um, this is in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of General Laws. A public hearing will be held on February 1st, 2018 at 705 in the City Council Chambers here at 212 Main Street, Northampton, on the petition of National Grid to install underground facilities under a public way on Atwood Drive. So that is our next City Council meeting on February 1st when we will we'll hold that hearing. <laughs> Let's go uh, first to uh, recognitions and one minute announcements from members of the council, if there are any. Councilor Nash. I have two. Uh, first of all, um, that in next month uh, on Thursday evenings, the police department will be running Citizen Police Academy. And uh, while it kind of conflicts with my uh, two Thursdays a month, um, the other nights I'm, I'm planning to attend and that, um, th that I've heard it's a great program and that it's free. And if you're interested in finding out more about our police department, this is a, uh, a great, I, I think Maureen did it, didn't you? I did too. I, no, I, I didn't do it. So um, anyway, so that's uh, starting in February. The other thing is uh, uh, next Tuesday, the 23rd at 11 a.m. at Historic Northampton, um, uh, Forrester and Oxen driver Tom <coughs> Jenkins of Blue, Blue Dog Forestry will bring his Oxen Rock and Star to Historic Northampton for an outdoor demonstration of Oxen logging. After the 45 minute presentation, Rock and Star will drag logs from Historic Northampton down Bridge Street to 33 Holly Street. Everyone is invited to join the parade and follow the oxen down the street. Um, for more than a century, a lumber yard operated at, Holly, at the Holly Street site, now the Northampton's Arts Trust, and that's the reason for ending the parade there. So anyway, uh, I know it's in the middle of the day, but if you can make it, that would be kind of fun. Yeah. Thank you, although I'm disappointed that in your new role as, as a member of the Transportation and Parking Commission, <laughs> you didn't relay the joke you told me, which is you're going to work on establishing oxen lanes throughout the city. Yeah. I, I th <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to it. Think about it. Yeah. Okay. Are there other uh, announcements? Councilor Sheriff. Um, on Friday, February 2nd at 7.30 a.m., there is the 2018 Library Legislative Breakfast, um, which is uh, for our state senate district, it's held at libraries all around um, in that district. This year, it's here in Forbes Library. Um, so that's at 7.30 on Friday, February 2nd. State funding for libraries and for interlibrary resources has been consistently dropping for years, and that shifts the burden onto municipalities. As we well know, the city covers the vast majority of Forbes uh, budget, <coughs> and anything we can do to lobby <coughs> for state aid for libraries um, will benefit all of us in many ways. So uh, come out, 7.30. February 2nd and um, talk to the legislators that will be there and lobby for more library funding. Thank you. Are there other uh, one minute announcements? Councilor Bidwell. Uh, uh, another February announcement. On Monday, February 5th, <clears throat> the Senate Task Force on Strengthening Massachusetts Local Retailers will be holding a public hearing 
uh, at Union Station at 10:30 on that Monday. <coughs> and this is the this is a task force set up by the by the legislature to hear testimony around the around the state on the challenges and the opportunities facing local retail. And this uh, public hearing will be co-hosted by Northampton's own Judy Harrell, who's a, a, a member of that task force. So it's an opportunity to listen, learn, comment on the state of uh, retail here in the country. Thank you. Other announcements? I'll just mention, too, um, it's Saturday, isn't it? Saturday 11, that the Pioneer Valley Women's March, uh, the second annual event. Um, I'll be participating. I know a number of counselors will be. Uh, and I invite members of the public to also participate. It starts at Sheldon Field um, at 11 o'clock, I believe. Um, I would like to announce a, a community meeting that I am going to be doing. Um, this will be Wednesday, January 31st uh, at 6 o'clock um, in the hearing room in City Hall. Uh, the purpose is just to kind of have an open town hall style meeting um, now that we're starting a new term in, this, in the City Council, um, to hear from members of the public about what they think should be priorities for the next two years and discuss some of the issues that may come up um, in the City Council and have kind of an open Q&A. So if you've got nothing else to do and you want to have a Q&A with me, you can do that on uh, Wednesday, January 31st at 6 o'clock. Uh, and so if there's no <coughs> other one-minute announcements, um, I'll announce uh, our committee assignments, and I think that members of the council received and, and I assume read the letter that was publicly posted in the agenda on Tuesday, but I'll explain it partly for the benefit of the public. Um, every two years, the council president makes various appointments to council committees and then makes formal recommendations to the mayor for his appointment uh, to a couple um, of mayoral bodies. And I'd just like to explain to the council some of my thinking about this. Um, I gave it a lot of thought and I tried to come up with a framework to make um, some good decisions about this. And I came up with six principles that I tried to accomplish with these appointments. Um, and I'll just run through them if you don't mind. The first principle is a pretty straightforward one, which is counselors should get their preferences whenever possible. Um, and this is just to make sure that counselor, counselors are enthusiastic about the committee work that they'll be doing. Some statistics on that, um, counselors submitted rankings for their preferences. 100% um, of counselors received their first choice preferences. 75% uh, of counselors received their first and second choices. Uh, about two thirds received their first choice and then either their second or third, and half of the council received their first, second, and third. So I hope that most people got uh, the preferences that they were enthusiastic about. Another principle in these assignments is I think that every city council committee should have a gender balance. Um, this has not um, always been the case in the city. Um, I don't think it's something that has ever been intentional when it has not been the case, and sometimes it has and sometimes it hasn't. But that was an important factor that I tried to achieve. And the organization that I uh, set forth does achieve that. Uh, third, the quorums between our committees um, shouldn't overlap. So that means if we have two committees of four people, uh, I try to avoid having the same three people on, on two committees because then the committees would be too similar. And you would also perhaps run into strange kind of open meeting law quorum issues. So I tried to avoid that. Um, I also wanted to make sure and a similar thing is um, I, I wanted to ensure that any two counselors on any council committee could talk to me as council president and receive support and, uh, and help if they wanted it on whatever they're working on in the committees without triggering an open meeting law conflict. Um, I considered the experience that many counselors bring to committees. Some counselors have been on committees for quite a while and bring lots of experience. And I thought that was important, but I also thought it was important to develop and build new experience for other counselors. And finally, we often think about this process as something that's just for us, and it's largely for us, but it's also important to remember that this is something for the public as well. So I try to <coughs> put forth an organization that I think <coughs> allows us to, le to <coughs> legislate effectively um, in the public interest. So <coughs> here's my 
my, those were my rules of thumb, and with that in mind, uh, I appointed the following counselors to the following committees. Uh, to the Committee on Legislative Matters, Councilors Dwight, Klein, Murphy, and Carney. To the Committee on Finance, Councilors Murphy, Shara, Carney, and Labarge. To the Committee on Community Resources, Councilor Shara, Bidwell, Klein, and Nash. To the Committee on City Services, Councilors Carney, Labarge, Bidwell, and Nash. And I made the recommendations um, to the following multiple member bodies as follows. To the Energy and Sustainability Commission, Councilors Dwight and Klein. To the Disability Commission, Councilor Labarge. And to the Transportation and Parking Commission, uh, Councilors Nash and Shara. Just a couple of other points. You'll notice I did not appoint counselors to the Public Works and Utilities Commission, and I proposed a rule change that I expect the council will uh, debate. The Public Works and Utilities Commission was a successor to a previous body that dealt with public works. Um, <coughs> that before our charter change and reorganization of, of government and kind of a clearer definition of separation of powers, used to actually have DPW staff as part of the committee. And it no longer does. And we've had this other committee for the past two years um, that has tried to fill the gap. Um, unfortunately, the committee has met uh, uh, not as often as I think it should. It's met three or four times a year. Um, as of today, it hasn't met for 297 days. So I'd like to explore a better way for the council to deal with this jurisdiction and these issues. And that uh, will be up for debate at a later time. Um, so please organize an initial meeting as soon as you can. As you know, scheduling is not subject to the open meeting law, so you can talk amongst yourselves about scheduling after we adjourn as long as you don't talk about substantive issues. Uh, I request that you elect both a chair, a, a chair and vice chair. In the past, I've seen committees only elect the chair, and then when the chair is not there, there's kind of just an arbitrary decision about who will preside. So I think there should be a, a vice chair. And the first person who was listed in all the names that I read off will serve as the, uh, the temporary chair for the purpose of that election. And then finally, please vote on a, a meeting schedule. So those are the committee assignments for the 2018-2019 session. Now we are come to a uh, presentation from our Director of Public Works, Donna Lascalia. Uh, this is relative to the stormwater and flood <coughs> control uh, utility and what it, what's been going on for fiscal year 2017. And this is required by the ordinance that establishes uh, the committee. So I'd like to invite Director Lascalia to come up if she's ready to provide this presentation. And one note, you know, this is a, as I understand it, this is a presentation from the director to the council. Uh, this is not kind of an open discussion about stormwater and all its aspects. I think that's an important thing to point out. So we turn the floor over to Director Scalia. Okay, thank you. Good evening. This is the stormwater and flood control utility presentation for FY17. Okay, so the stormwater and flood control utility was established on March 20th, 2014. So we have three full fiscal years of operations behind us now. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about financials for FY17, but mostly I'm gonna focus on the projects that we've been able to complete using the resources available to us through the utility. So this slide shows the FY17 revenues, um, totaling a little more than $1.9 million, which were in line with our expectations. And this slide shows our expenditures, um, broken down into several <coughs> categories here, PS, <coughs> personnel, OM is operations and maintenance, OOM, other than ordinary maintenance, uh, also referred to as capital. Um, we have debt service and we also have <coughs> indirects, um, totals a little more than $1.2 million. So. Uh, I'll just call your attention to the, the difference between the revenue collected 
and our expenditures and the difference is money that we have encumbered for projects that span fiscal year. So a lot of time when we do construction projects, it's a timing issue um, and you know we, we are spanning the summer construction season. So that's why you're seeing that difference between revenue and expenditures. And this slide is just showing the three full fiscal years of operation and kind of a side-by-side -side comparison for revenue and expenditures, and, and they're mostly consistent. And just a few words about credits. Um, so our billing for FY17 included more than 11,000 properties citywide, and we issued uh, credits to more than 1,000 properties for a total value of $76,503. Um, so credits can, can be issued for many reasons, uh, small residential <coughs> gardens, um, protected land, and, and also need-based credits, among others. So in FY17, we uh, paid salaries for the equivalent of <coughs> 9.78 full-time positions out of this utility. This is everything from the folks who drive the street sweeper to a portion of my salary to the financial administrator to engineering staff. Um, what you will notice is in FY18, um, we did do a little reorganization within the, depart within the department after uh, I became director, and that number's down to a little more than six, the equivalent of six full-time positions, and you'll see something similar to that for FY19. And this slide, uh, very uh, similar to last year's presentation, just talks about indirects, which I think is a, a concept everyone's familiar with. So it, employee benefits need to be accounted for, um, you know, health insurance and uh, uh, workers' compensation, retirement, and so on. So this is a charge back to the utility um, for uh, those benefits. Why are we doing what we're doing? relative to this utility and the answer is the EPA is the regulatory authority that oversees the our stormwater system and they issue us what's called an MS4 permit and we are anticipating the issuance of a new permit on July 1st 2018 and we will need to uh, communicate with EPA by the end of the fall and acknowledge that we are covered under this permit and that we will meet its requirements. And then in mid-2019, we will need to have a more comprehensive plan about how we are going to come into compliance with this permit. So what's in the permit? It's got six <laughs> major sections. Um, they're there, um, I won't read them, but I will note that we have already taken measures through the utility to be in sort of what I would call c compliance already. Um, you know, we, we always have to upgrade our operations, um, but we have done <coughs> a lot of work to put ourselves in a really good position to, to be in compliance. Um, and, and just a, a, a couple of high points. Um, illicit discharge detection and elimination. So this would be a situation where we have a sewer connected to a storm drain. So anytime we find a situation like this, obviously sewage needs to go to the, to the wastewater treatment plant to be treated before it's discharged. So if we find a situation like that, we need to address it immediately. So uh, you know our department works with whoever the property owner is to address that situation. And we have you know an ordinance that assists us with the administration of this. So a few words about operations and maintenance. Um, so I always think it's helpful to have a map just to kind of show the, the scale of the operation. So catch basins and intakes, this is where the water flows to. And here they are, more than 5,000 all over the city. And every one of these needs to be maintained. And this is how we maintain them. You have a catch basin cleaner. Um, you can see on the left-hand slide, it's got that's sort of like this clamshell attachment and the catch basin becomes filled with debris. So we have to travel to the catch basins and scoop the debris out. Um, it goes into that body and, and we dump it. Um, I will mention this is a 2005 truck. We were able to replace the body which had, which had completely rusted out with a stainless steel one for a little under $20,000. Allows us to get more time out of the truck. And maybe some of you have seen these labels around town. Um, we want to encourage people to not dump things like 
oil down the catch basin um, or things that don't belong in a river. So this is just a friendly reminder for people um, that this is actually flowing directly to the river without any sort of treatment. Um, and this is also part of our, our permit, too. This is part of permit compliance, is we need to educate the public about what, what is this <coughs> thing and where does it go. Um, and this is an example of how we do that sort of public communication. So more infrastructure maps, uh, manholes more than 2,500 all throughout the city. Each, it's kind of hard to see, but each one of those is a dot you look really closely. So what needs to happen to each one of these? They need to be maintained, you know, they, they, uh, they get displaced or they break or, you know, get hit by a snow plow or whatever. So um, this is something that we do with our in-house labor. Um, <coughs> you can see um, there's quite a bit of work that, that goes into it. Street sweeping. So this is part of keeping debris out of the catch basin, sort of preemptive. You know, we don't want uh, leaves and branches and trash in the streets. So not only is it unsightly, it uh, causes flow problems. So we sweep all the streets by ward um, annually, as everyone knows, and then monthly sweeping um, in Florence Center and, and sort of in the downtown corridor. We also sweep. Um, special events, you know, the holiday stroll, the summer stroll, um, the cleanup after those. So we also have known trouble spots throughout the city that flood kind of areas that are just on our list that we need to keep an eye on. So these are regularly patrolled. Um, I've just kind of highlighted them here for your information. They're kind of all over the place. Um, so again, it's a kind of a personnel and a time thing, but you know, King Street, Church Street, Federal Street, Nonatuck Street, Ryan Road, Prospect Street. So th there's a lot of places that are firmly on our radar that we know we have to keep an eye on. Storm event flood mitigation. So this is a very timely slide. Um, we think about the weather that we've had over the past couple of weeks, you know, really, really cold and then snow and then heavy rain and really, really warm. So you look at that picture on the left-hand side, instead of um, you know, branches and leaves there, think about ice. So that's what we've been chasing for the last week and a half is ice um, on these grades. <coughs> and you know, if we don't remove it, the water has nowhere to go. Um, so this is kind of the regular maintenance that we have to do, and it's really year-round we have to do it um, because the rain never stops. Um, so what you're seeing are, are pictures. Um, uh, the picture on the right-hand side is actually down at the wastewater treatment plant at the flood control station, and that's an area we have to keep an eye on too because if we have debris that starts backing up into the flood control station, that wreaks havoc with our pumps. Get that Drain ditches. Well, ditches are sometimes referred to as country drainage. Um, it's not necessarily a, a defi as defined of a system as, say, like a pipe system, um, but it still requires maintenance because it overgrows or gets clogged with trash or whatever. Um, so it's still something that we have to pay attention to. We have more than six miles of these designated in red kind of all over the city. Here's one of our trouble spots, King Street Brook. This is something we pay attention to um, daily, weekly, and annually in a variety of ways. Um, but we go in there every year and remove uh, debris from the channel between Barrett Street and the culvert behind CVS. Um, we can't allow debris to, to back up against that grate, which you see in the second slide over. More infrastructure culverts, more than 200. These are the channels that pass underneath the roadway. Um, if they were to fail, the roadway drops right into them, so very important for us to be maintaining. Stormwater system inspections. Um, so this is sort of a, a, an interesting uh, part of what we do at the DPW. Um, we have, we refer to it as the camera van, and you see it down in the, in the bottom middle slide. Um, and it's actually a shared resource between the sewer and the stormwater enterprise. And if you look at the slide in the top right hand corner, or the picture in the top right hand corner of that slide, that's the camera. We open a manhole and we drop that camera down into the system. And that thing runs through the system, and we can see what, what you're seeing in the second picture over is actually a picture inside um, the Market Street Brook. 
And so we can see, you know, is there a breach somewhere? Is there debris in the way that's impeding water? This is how we find a lot of our problems and then fix them. But these investigations are absolutely integral to what we do because this is providing us information we otherwise wouldn't have access to. You'd be like digging a hole and to, to find your problem. Um, so this is, uh, we were using a camera van from 1982. Um, and so we uh, have the pleasure of a new truck now. Um, again, a shared resource between sewer and stormwater. Um, cost almost $300,000, but well worth it. So speaking of pipes, we have more than 120 miles of stormwater pipes throughout the system. And here's a few photos of, uh, of our personnel, um, <coughs> just kind of what sort of repairs are we able to do in-house versus what we have to hire a contractor for. Um, we, we are able to, uh, a lot of this infrastructure is buried at depths that we can't reach with our equipment. Um, so anything more than, you know, 10 feet starts to become a little bit tricky for us to get to. Um, but just I wanted to just include a few photos of some of the in-house repairs that we are able to do um, if it's not at too great of a depth for us to reach. Outfalls, more than 400. Definition of an outfall is a point where the municipal stormwater discharges to a waterway of the United States. Um, so this goes back to the MS4 permit and we need to make certain that we don't have any sort of illicit discharges going into our waterways, let it read, you know, sewage or chemicals, um, and, and oftentimes that happens. So we, we need to know where these are. We need to be able to monitor and test them and make sure that there's only water flowing out of them. And here's a photo of an outfall for reference. Another part of our, uh, of the operation that's funded by this utility is stormwater management for new developments and redevelopments. Um, anytime there's a project that disturbs more than one acre in the city, a uh, stormwater management permit is required and we have dedicated staff who work with um, contractors and developers in town to make sure that they're in compliance with these requirements. Um, you're seeing some pictures of West Hampton Road, TJDL development, and Olander Drive for ServiceNet. Lower right is um, infiltration galleys, and that's related to service now. So switching gears for a minute, this is, um, <coughs> this is our flood control system. Um, and I have two slides here. This is the Mill River portion, um, just to give you uh, an idea of the scope of the levee system and associated pump stations. Um, in particular, um, at the 1,000 linear feet of the levee, and this is important for vegetation management, which I'll speak to a, a little bit more in a moment. And this is the Connecticut River portion, and you can see 4,800 linear feet. <coughs> so now we get to vegetation maintenance. The levees have to be maintained. This falls under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers, so they have uh, particular standards that they hold us to. Um, they were the, the folks who built this system for us, and we have to maintain it to their liking. So one of the things we have to be very cognizant of is vegetation control, because if we have uh, large trees growing into the side of the levee, it can undermine uh, those levees. So we, we have to be very careful to uh, strictly maintain this. Um, a lot of the mowing we do is done in-house. A lot of vegetation control we do is done in-house. Some of it has to be contracted out because it's in areas that aren't accessible. Um, and we completed a project uh, a couple of years back um, to do some restoration uh, with an outside contractor. And that's actually what the debt service that you saw in the, um, in the expense slide was from. Pump station, so this is the pump station down at uh, Hockenham Road, um, adjacent to the um, wastewater treatment plant, and um, maybe some of you are familiar with the uh, old pumps that are inside of it, so our staff does kind of regular maintenance on these, you know, changes the oil, spark plugs, that sort of thing. Um, we've also put some money into the uh, fuel storage tanks, and that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side, diesel and gas. Um, we had to make some improvements to come into environmental compliance. 
And these are some photos of the old Springfield Road Oxbow Bridge. Um, we had to do a short-term stabilization here. You can see the uh, top photo, um, that footing had, had sort of shifted and was being undermined. So this was an in-house repair that we did to stabilize this bridge. Um, this is an ancillary structure to the flood control system. Um, but we're also taking a look at the uh, city's emergency flood plan um, and making some updates to that. Um, we're also taking a look at some of the penetrations of the levees that are done by our utilities and third-party utilities. Um, so it's, it's kind of an um, uh, overall assessment of, of what is um, the flood control system and just updating the material that we have and making sure that our operations um, are solid in the event that we need to deploy stop log structures and the like. So I'll speak a little bit to kind of some large scale repairs that we've done uh, in <coughs> FY17. Here's a, a map um, just sort of showing, you know, where these improvements have been all over the city. Um, I'll speak a little bit just kind of project by project here briefly. North Farms Road, we did a pretty significant project here over the summer to replace the water line. Um, as part of that, uh, we did some stormwater work totaling about $100,000. Uh, it was an eight inch drain pipe and a stone culvert. Um, when we do large scale roadway reconstruction, we try to bundle utilities for efficiency purposes. And you will see that in a lot of these slides. Woodlawn Avenue, this is an example of something that we were able to do, to do in-house. Um, this is like a before and after photo. So the, the bottom middle is before and the top left and right is after. And same thing, Belmont Ave, uh, we have some very talented folks who work for us. So, you know, you, you only see kind of what's on the top of the street and don't necessarily pay attention to what's below it. So the purpose of these photos is to just give you an idea of what you're actually driving on top of or what you're seeing when you see that grate. Day Avenue, this was another significant project that we undertook uh, over the summer. Um, this was uh, more than a million dollar project, uh, stormwater more than $100,000 here. Um, we replaced the, um, the pipe uh, going right down the middle of the road. This is Woodmont Road, um, and this actually ties into the next slide, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, which ties into the new underpass um, for the bike path. And uh, that's kind of a known trouble spot for us, known flooding. So we've been working with Mass DOT to basically make improvements to that entire system. Um, so this was a, a little excavation that we did on Woodmont Road. And then if you look at this photo, this was actually funded by Mass DOT as part of that underpass project. This is behind DA Sullivan. And we had a very old drain pipe here that had heaved out of the ground and was contributing to some flooding problems. So this work is complete and uh, we're seeing some relief. Wilson Avenue, interesting story here. This started as, as street flooding that was called in by the residents. And uh, we did some investigation and uh, determined that we needed to install a catch basin. Um, and we did, spliced into the existing system. Um, this, this work took place at a depth of 12 feet. Um, we had a call upon our contractor who, who we um, use for situations like this. And that's a photo of their work. Lasky Park, everyone's familiar with this. Um, so there was some drainage work associated with phase two as there was with phase one. Um, the, the biggest um, thing of note here was we did have sewer and stormwater infrastructure combined here before we separated it. So we actually had stormwater flowing to the wastewater treatment plant. So that's not a good thing because that contributes to flow and we're treating water that we don't actually need to be treated, uh, that needs to be treated. Um, and there's uh, an expense associated with that. So that is kind of a highlight of, of phase two. Um, and Hankley Street, this is a big one. So this is a nearly $3 million project. Um, and what you're seeing there is uh, 30 and 36 inch drain pipes. Um, that's uh, about as big as it gets in the city. Nutting Avenue, uh, we had our TV camera van um, doing some inspections and uh, we determined to break in the pipe 
um, and we retain the services again of our contractor. This was at a depth of 13 feet. Um, this was about $75,000 project here. And this is an example of um, <coughs> of one of our uh, one of the folks who works for the sewer stormwater division. Um, he actually built that on Penn Castle Drive. So again, we do. Um, we do as much as we can in-house, um, you know, because there's obviously a, a cost savings associated with that. So that's an example of the sort of work we're able to do in-house. Riverside Drive, this is part of a project to repair a sewer leak. Um, and while we were repairing the sewer leak, we discovered a broken drain pipe. So the picture's kind of dark on the bottom left of your screen there. Um, but this was in a very difficult spot. You can kind of see in the photo in the top left there. Um, so again, we, uh, we had our contractor do that for us. Ryan Road, we repaved Ryan Road last summer. Before we were able to repave it, we had to address some drainage problems. Um, you know, drainage is the enemy of good pavement. Um, and it can definitely, um, you know, undermine new work. So we wanted to make sure that we addressed existing drainage issues there before we paved the road. And so these are a couple of photos of that work. Pipe and subdrain near Burt's Pit um, is part of that project. And finally, Audubon Road. Um, this is a million dollar project. Stormwater piece of this is, is a quarter million dollars. Um, and what you're seeing in the bottom right there is the new culvert that was installed as part of that project. So to wrap up here, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, what our plans are for, for the coming year um, and beyond. Um, Hinkley Street will continue into next fiscal year um, or, and next calendar year, of course. Um, so we will be doing an outfall reconstruction at Riverside Drive. Um, that's going to start in the spring. Um, we're also looking at drain repairs on Chesterfield Road as part of future roadway reconstruction. And we're looking at 9,064 linear feet of Burt's Pit Road. Um, survey and assessment of that are already underway. Um, there are drainage improvements that we are going to have to undertake uh, as part of any roadway reconstruction there. So we are currently taking a look at that. And as far as the flood control system goes, um, we are going to be uh, doing an assessment of the actual pumps at the flood control building uh, on Hockenham Road. Um, we are looking to award that contract probably in March, um, and we're anticipating about a $175,000 contract. Um, for someone to uh, do an assessment of those pumps and, and sort of operationally which direction we need to go um, in terms of making improvements to them. Um, we also need to continue to uh, assess the vegetation situation along the levees. Um, you're seeing that, uh, a photo of that on the right-hand side. I mean, this is, this is just sort of a, a constant uh, upkeep that we have to do, and we're trying to institute some sort of long-range plan <coughs> to deal with that. And that concludes this year's stormwater and flood control utility presentation. Well, we, we thank you for it. That, was, that was excellent, very informative. I, I think it would be in order if any members of the council wanted to ask kind of clarifying questions that are directly related to the presentation, if the director is willing. <coughs> is it possible? I, I'm, are you going to be posting this on your yes. page? Okay. It would be good. It'd be good to access it. To be perfectly honest, I couldn't read half of it. So, but. Um, I, I agree with uh, the council president's summation, but I, I think um, it's rather critical. The public uh, has expressed in the past some concerns about the, the, you know, what it is the money is going that is going that they're paying for the stormwater. <coughs> it was mm -hmm. actually a central theme of the last mayoral uh, campaign, pretty much, and. I think it's important for people to understand that, for instance, this system right here, that you, the, the last thing we end up on, the, those, those pumps that you're describing are old PT boat engines, um, and they don't make those engines anymore. Parts, you guys are manufacturing parts, and we've always talked about the, the critical need in order to, uh, you know, if, if 
the opportunity for catastrophic failure is pretty high. So uh, we have to we have to reinvest and protect our our, uh, our stormwater management system, particularly at this end where it discharges into the river. So, so there wasn't any question other than that you're putting this on the site, right? Yes, we will. And, and, you know, one of the reasons that we selected the photos that we did was we, we kind of wanted to show everyone, and we will, we'll post this on, on the DPW's website, but we, we wanted to show kind of the very broad range of work we do, you know, the, what we're able to accomplish in-house, what we have to hire out. Um, but it, it, it really kind of runs the gamut, and that's what we were trying to capture with this presentation. That's why th there was, you know, not a lot of words, but a lot of photos. And I, I think that's, you know, a good way to communicate kind of the, the scale of the operation. Councilor Barge. Yeah. Um, Donna, how much does it cost for the camera? Because I've seen it, and I've seen them operate it. I'm just wondering, what is the cost of that? So the, the camera was wrapped up in the overall cost of the van, which was uh, roughly $284,000. I, I don't know specifically how much the That's camera cost. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of machinery for sure. I thank you very much for coming in and doing this presentation sure. and put it up on our website so people can see it. to understand the um, level, the depth of work that goes into maintaining our flood, water and, flood and stormwater system. So um, this is really useful. I appreciate it. <clears throat> but I wanted to ask, too, about um, how much the DPW is engaged in looking at kind of green infrastructure to accompany, you know, kind of the more traditional infrastructure for flood control, how much, you know, like, um, erosion resistant planting happens how much um, how much do you recommend kind of drainage swales that can absorb some of the water and all of those kinds of things and how do you work with other departments in the city that do that kind of green infrastructure envisioning and and um, creation because it, it seems like that that could really supplement you know the kind of stuff that we saw in your presentation yeah I think you saw that with Pulaski Park phase one i mean that's a that's a perfect example of of sort of moving in that direction you know away from you know traditional stormwater management you know here's the pipe here's the catch basin um so you know you're seeing that that kind of moving in a a, a greener direction you know with the bioswale and and some of the uh, plantings that we did uh, for phase one. So I, I think that, um, you know, it's firmly on our radar and given any opportunity, we take it. Pleasant Street as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We did, we did the same at, on Pleasant Street as well, at the end of Pleasant Street. Yeah. It's all rain infiltration systems. We have the intersection of Hockman Park. That's all rain yards. And all those kinds of things are the underground rain yards. Councilman Nash, is your question? Um, the, uh, with, with the uh, stormwater pumps, uh, that there's going to be a study for $175,000 to recommend <coughs> new pumps. They're not just going to come in and say, oh, you need new pumps. They, that there's a, what kind of details do they provide us with those recommendations? They're going to provide us with alternatives. So it's not going to be just you need to replace these. That will likely be one of the alternatives. Um, but what we are asking for is a thorough assessment of the operation, maintenance, and sort of future viability of these pieces of machinery. Um, and we are going to ask whoever is award awarded the contract to give us some very viable alternatives for which direction we move. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I would just like to kind of say what you said well, you said it far too humbly, which is that the DPW does uh, a mind-blowing amount of work. And uh, this presentation, even though it's so comprehensive, it's still just a fraction of everything your department does. But I just want to make sure uh, it's clear how much I appreciate everything you do. And I think, I think the council all feels the same way. And it's very helpful to members of the public to have this information and also just to have a sense of the scale of what you're working with, 
when it comes to stormwater management. So we appreciate that and thank you for taking the extra time to come here and give an equally comprehensive presentation about your work. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, other 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 communications from the mayor. Yeah, I just I was just going to quickly follow up and again thank uh, Director Lascalia for the work that um, she and her department are doing, um, and also to say you know we're coming up. Um, this will be our we're in our fourth, um, fiscal year now fiscal year 18. We're about to cross over into our fifth fiscal year when we develop the FY19 budget of this new utility, um, and I am going to be I, I think. Um, Councillor Dwight referenced that, that um, there was a lot of conversation about the utility um, last year. Um, and one of the things that I took away from those conversations was um, really wanting to, we've, we've made some changes to the ordinance over time, um, mostly to credits, that we've, we've made reforms to the credit policy. Um, and so I'm going to be working with Director of Escalia and the DPW over the next several months um, uh, to look at potential reforms to the uh, to the ordinance itself, making some changes to the ordinance itself um, to try to address some of the issues that um, that we've heard over the first you know now four going on five fiscal years. Um, so I wanted to kind of let the council know that um, nothing. Obviously, we have a capital process, we have a budget process to deal with. This would be in the fall uh, that I would anticipate bringing those forward. But I did want to say just to follow on to the presentation that, you know, I think we're, we're trying to get the information out to people, but then there's also just a question about people understanding how their bill works, how it's administered, um, and so looking at ways to try to address that as well. So we're going to be working on that. So just wanted to follow on with that. I appreciate yeah. that. Councilor Barge, you have a, a question without getting into the substance of? <coughs> yes, so okay, I'm, go right ahead. Mayor, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you present that, mm -hmm. and I think Quite a bit of my residents will be happy mm -hmm. about you doing what you're going to do. Well, you know, again, similar, you know, um, a few years ago we had some questions about our water and sewer rates. Um, and so we took, spent some time and did, did sort of a deep dive and looked at them. And so, you know, we have experience now with how it actually has worked. And we're going to do a similar deep dive to see if there's um, potential changes we could put forth um, to, to try to address some of those issues. And that's my only communication. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Mayor. So we'll now go to um, resolutions. Um, Point of order. Uh, Councilor. Could, could I just mention the possibility that the, the presentation that comes next, following resolutions on Community Choice Energy Plus, would it be possible to put that before we actually take up the matter of the resolution on? I think it would inform our conversation. I'll tell you what I was going to recommend is I would like to put the resolution on the floor and then recognize our <coughs> presenter to speak during that item. I think that'd be the most effective way. So why don't we do that? Uh, since I, I also have a feeling most people are here for that. Um, this is R18003. This is a resolution of the City Council of Northampton in support of 100% renewable energy. Uh, it comes upon the recommendation of Councillor Elisa F. Klein, Councillor William H. Dwight, Northampton's Northampton Mayor's Youth Commission and the Energy and Sustainability Commission. Uh, the resolution is quite lengthy, uh, so I'm going to read it. Uh, so be prepared. And then we can have a motion to get it on the floor. Um, whereas too much of our energy in the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton comes from fossil fuels that pollute our air and water and damage our climate. And whereas Massachusetts communities are already experiencing the impacts of global warming through environmental phenomena such as rising sea levels, unprecedentedly severe storms, temperature extremes, and elevated particulate matter and smog pollution, and public health da dangers such as an increase in pollution-related asthma and cardiovascular disease. And whereas a goal of 100% renewable clean energy will contribute to the mitigation of climate change, improve our city's air, and water quality and protect the health of our community's children, adults, and families. And whereas the city of Northampton is already a proven leader in actively reducing carbon emissions and promoting clean energy by first developing and implementing the Sustainable Northampton Master Plan, constructing a large municipal solar array on a capped landfill, installing solar panels on several city-owned buildings, and promoting a successful solarized Northampton program conducting the Heat Smart Northampton initiative to encourage residents and businesses to install cold climate air source heat pumps, 
developing and expanding bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure throughout the city, implementing energy efficiency upgrades in municipal buildings and streetlights, requiring new or renovated city buildings to meet LEED standards, purchasing electric vehicles and installing public charging stations on city property. Mayor David J. Narkowitz signing on to the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, committing the city to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and enhancing resilience to climate change, and signing on to the Climate Mayor's Agreement to adopt and uphold the climate change mitigation goals enshrined in the Paris Agreement, despite President Donald Trump's withdrawal of the United States from the agreement. And finally, the City Council passing unanimously an April 20th, 2017 resolution calling on the Massachusetts Legislature to establish carbon pollution pricing to curb climate change. And whereas the transition to 100% renewable energy will promote employment opportunities and economic growth in Massachusetts and Northampton, facilitate local control and ownership over energy options, and bring tangible benefits to low-income residents and others who have been historically disadvantaged by fossil fuel-based energy systems. And whereas the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton can get 100% of our energy from clean renewable sources by harnessing our abundant solar and wind resources and taking advantage of innovations in, ener in energy efficiency, green transportation, energy storage, and other technologies. And whereas Northampton, whereas as Northampton revises its sustainable Northampton plan for the next 10 years, it is incumbent upon us to continue our environmental leadership throughout the state and the United States by adopting an ambitious and comprehensive plan to phase out the use of fossil fuels, transition to renewable energy, and incorporate many principles consistent with the con concepts outlined herein. And whereas S-1849, an act transitioning Massachusetts to 100% renewable energy, and H-3395 of the same name, currently being considered in the Massachusetts State Legislature, call for the transition of the Commonwealth to, quote, 100% clean renewable energy by 2050 in order to first avoid pollution of our air, water, and land, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and ultimately eliminate our use of fossil fuels and other polluting and dangerous forms of energy. To increase energy security by reducing our reliance on imported sources of energy and maximizing renewable energy production in Massachusetts and in our region. Uh, third, increase economic development by stimulating public and private investments in clean energy and energy efficiency projects. Four, create local jobs by harnessing Massachusetts's skilled workforce, business leadership, and academic institutions to advance new technologies, improve the energy performance of homes and workplaces, and deploy renewable energy across the Commonwealth. And five, improve the quality of life and economic well-being of all Massachusetts residents with an emphasis on communities and populations that have been disproportionately affected by pollution and high costs under our energy system. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts supports rapid attainment of a goal of 100% <coughs> clean renewable energy for the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton. Be it further resolved that the City Council, excuse me, that the city of Northampton should consider all municipal decisions in light of whether or not they will bring the city and its residents, businesses, and institutions closer to 100% renewable energy, and will avoid taking actions that could increase the use of fossil fuels or delay the transition to 100% renewable energy. Be it further resolved that the city of Northampton should strive to continue to take actions that promote clean energy and reduce fossil fuel use, including continued energy efficiency upgrades in municipal buildings, continued promotion of energy efficiency upgrades in private homes and businesses, consideration of the use of municipal electricity aggregation, also known as community choice aggregation, or CCA, also known as community choice energy, or CCE, uh, jointly with other nearby municipalities pursuant General Laws Chapter 164, Section 134, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, stabilize our electricity rates, and add resiliency to our electric grid through the development of a comprehensive energy plan to reduce our energy consumption, develop local renewable energy generation, and exceed the renewable portfolio standard requirement for Class 1 RECs in our energy supply. 
Um, almost there. Be it further resolved that the City Council of Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, supports the aforementioned state legislation, uh, applauds Representative Peter V. Cocott for signing on as a petitioner to the House bill, and urges the Massachusetts Senate, House of Representatives, and Governor of the Commonwealth to adopt in a timely manner these or other similar bills that will bring Massachusetts in line with a 100% renewable future. Uh, and the final uh, resolve asks that this be sent essentially to our federal and state representatives, in, um, including those on the key joint uh, committee. So I might waive that reading of that section if, that's, if there's no objection to that. So that is the resolution. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Second. second. Made and seconded. Um, I'd first like to recognize and ask for a motion to recognize Mr. Sam Teitelman, who is here to make a presentation on part of it. Second. Made by Councillor Klein, seconded by Councillor Bidwell. Mr. Teitelman, uh, please come up. Um, first, I'd ask if the sponsors wish to introduce the resolution or if they would ask Mr. Teitelman to start. It's, well, what Sam's going to be speaking to is one significant bullet point, but a bullet point on this on the whole document. But uh, so maybe it makes sense for one of the sponsors to give an <clears throat> overall introduction. <laughs> well, I just realized as I was saying that what I was yeah. stepping up for. Yeah. So go right ahead, Councilor Dwight. <laughs> <laughs> um, and by the way, we I, I think we we did move to uh, recognize Sam, but we didn't vote on it. So. Oh. So, Absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so all those in favor of recognizing. Aye. 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 And feel free if you want to sit down while the re others are talking. You're really <laughs> happy to do that. And, and, while, and while you're setting up your presentation, yeah. essentially. But, yeah. but you're recognized <coughs> if you want to get up at any point. So Councilor Dwight, please. You know, and again, as, as we've often said, the resolutions are aspirational documents. It's basically, in this instance, it's an appeal to the state legislature um, and we're not alone in this, as it's been noted, but an appeal to the legislature to move on legislation that will set um, realistic, achievable goals that will actually um, get us off of a dependency, an addiction, if you will, to uh, fossil fuels and all the consequences thereof. And in fact, actually, the stormwater system that we spoke of has, has not an indirect, it's, it's a fairly direct corollary cause and effect. And the as you as you noted this is a very lengthy document a lengthy resolution but contained in it essentially as i said is the appeal and the desire to set the goals here in the community to to adjust our priorities to move away and transition towards a renewable energy a sustainable renewable energy uh sources for this community and this state and hopefully Thereby uh, creating an example that would be followed by other other communities in the in the city in the state, but also communities throughout the country, and this is, <coughs> of course, as noted in this, what prompted the somewhat the more urgent trend of this it was the president's um, abdication, if you will, from or uh, the, removing our our national commitment, making us the outlier towards trying to reduce all the things that contribute to global the, uh, global warming, aka climate change, and and all the consequences therein. And, and in fact, actually, as run in the other direction, and expanded drilling, offshore drilling, with the possible exception of Florida, uh, it, I guess it's who you know, uh, but certainly off the coast of Massachusetts, it has other environmental impacts beyond the consumption of it. It's actually the acquiring of these fossil fuels also have dilatorious impacts and one of the things Sam is going to speak with is one of one of the ways by which um, we can move towards those goals and in fact actually he will explain I think a lot more eloquently than I can about how the Massachusetts actually was the initiator and the leader in this in the legislation that allows for this and I've just come from uh, Sonoma County in Napa Valley where they they took our lead and ran with it. And I think maybe, maybe you'll be talking about that too, so I'll get out of your way. <laughs> You're not in my way. <laughs> well, well, um, thank Councilor you, Councilor Dwight. Dwight. Also? Oh, sorry, sorry Mr. Title. As the other sponsor, do you want to provide another introduction before we go to our presenter? Or? I don't need to provide an introduction. I have some comments that I'll make after. Okay. Sam's so, 
you, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Councillor O'Donnell, and thank you, Councillors Dwight and Klein, and thank you to the uh, Mayor's Youth Commission and the Energy and Sustainability Commission uh, for co-sponsoring this resolution and for your input and support, and thank you to the entire Council for your time and consideration this evening. Uh, this resolution reflects our deep concern about climate change and our belief that local government action is necessary to help address this mighty challenge. The resolution recognizes the important sustainability efforts that Northampton has already made and the achievements that it has already realized and seeks to build upon them by expressing support for a statewide 100% renewables bill and by stating that Northampton should consider its municipal decisions in light of the need to move the city and its residents, businesses, and institutions towards 100% renewable energy. To that effect, the resolution contains language asking Northampton to study and consider the concept of community choice energy, and in particular, a joint community choice energy entity that in Northampton's discretion, we hope would include Northampton and Pelham, uh, both of which have already expressed interest as well. I'm sorry, Amherst and Pelham. Thank you. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the exciting possibility of community choice energy. Massachusetts law enables individual and joint cities and towns, or cities and towns, to form individual and joint municipal electric <coughs> aggregations. This is commonly referred to as community choice energy, or CCE. Under the law, CCEs can perform two primary functions. The first is to collectively purchase electric power in bulk from competitive suppliers on behalf of the electricity consumers within the CCE's borders. These consumers can include residents, businesses, and other institutions, including our municipalities. And this electricity procurement action can include purchasing an electric supply that contains a greater percentage of renewable energy than what is required under Massachusetts law. Sorry. The second primary, trying to get the hang of the mouse, the second primary function that CCEs can perform under the law is to adopt an energy plan to implement energy efficiency, conservation, and renewable energy programs phasing in these programs over time to steadily reduce the community's electricity consumption and to displace fossil fuel generated electric power supply with re local renewable energy generation. We call CCEs, we call CCEs that perform both of these functions enumerated under the law a CCE plus. Here is a depiction of the relationship between the CCE plus, the utility, and the consumer. The CCE plus collectively buys the competitive electric power and eventually generates local renewable power on behalf of its consumers. The incumbent utility, which in the case of Northampton is National Grid, continues to perform the same functions that it does now. It owns and operates the centralized electric grid, delivers the power that the CCE purchases on behalf of its consumers, and provides those consumers with, con with consolidated billing and customer services. The charge that the CCE consumers pay for their electric consumption shows up as a line item on their national grid utility bill and national grid transfers that payment to the CCE. CCE Plus could benefit Northampton and other participating municipalities in many ways. For example, the CCE Plus energy plan could analyze local community energy use data to implement energy efficiency and renewable energy programs that are strategically tailored <coughs> to maximize reductions in electricity consumption and greenhouse gas emissions and to do so in ways that stabilize and reduce long-term electricity rates. This energy plan could fit well within the framework of the comprehensive climate resiliency and mitigation plans that Northampton is currently working to adopt as a part of the updating of its sustainable Northampton plan. The CCE Plus could essentially function like an energy office that helps its participating municipalities to develop, implement, and track their sustainability programs and projects, and to coordinate intermunicipal efforts as appropriate. CCE Plus can act as a vehicle for promoting value-adding energy services to its consumers, and it can make energy efficiency and the benefits of energy efficiencies and renewables more available and affordable to all participating community members. By using local service providers and resources 
to implement energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. The CCE Plus can support and create local jobs and make investments and other expenditures in our local economies. <coughs> so there are lots of potential economic benefits. How the enrollment works. Under the law, all electricity consumers within a CCE's borders are automatically enrolled in the CCE if either they receive the utility's electric power supply at the time the CCE is formed or if they are a new electricity consumer after the CCE is formed. All consumers receive advance notice of the CCE enrollment <coughs> and are free to opt out before and after the CCE begins its operations. With automatic enrollment, national opt-out rates range from 3 to 5 percent, which means that a high percentage of the community typically participates in the CCE. And this is a strategic advantage of creating one. How do we pay for a CCE Plus? Once operational, CCE Plus is revenue-based. <coughs> the electricity rates and fees that consumers would otherwise pay to the utility are bundled and redirected to support the CCE Plus, including an administrative fee that covers operating costs. There are, there are initial startup costs to hire a consultant uh, for the first year or so, we estimate, and these, these funds could come from grants, municipal appropriations, or a combination of the two, or elsewhere. A success, an example of a successful joint CCE Plus in Massachusetts is the Cape Light Compact. Established in 1997, the compact is operated by 21 <coughs> member towns on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard, serving approximately 200,000 consumers. 100% of the compact's competitive electric supply is matched with renewable energy credits. It has also helped develop 28.5 megawatts of local solar PV generation, and it offers grants for low-income solar PV ownership. Sorry. The compact focuses heavily on administering energy efficiency programs, and these programs have created $635 million in lifetime consumer benefits to date. Next steps. In its most recent fall town meeting, Amherst approved a resolution with language very similar to the one before you, aspiring to reach 100% renewable energy at both the town and state level and to explore the possibility of the joint CCE plus concept with neighboring communities like Massage, like Northampton and Pelham. We hope you will pass this resolution and that the city council, uh, that the Northampton city government will then take next steps to form an intermunicipal working group to further explore this possibility. Once the municipalities have adequately explored the concept of CCE plus, we hope the City Council will consider authorizing Northampton to develop a joint CCE Plus plan in cooperation with Amherst and Pelham, according to the findings of the study. And if it does so, that final plan would then need the approval of both the community and the state Department of Public Utilities. <clears throat> Residents of Northampton, Amherst, Pelham, and other surrounding communities have formed Western Mass Community Choice Energy to explore this concept, and we are committed to further supporting Northampton, Amherst, and Pelham in your efforts to explore this concept further. And I would just like to briefly acknowledge the enormous contributions of all the other um, community members, and in particular, Adele Franks, who couldn't be here tonight, who have made this resolution possible. And thank you, and okay. do you have any questions? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, is there a discussion in the council on this issue? Councilor Nash? Can I ask a question? Go no, right it's ahead. not a time. Just real quick, uh, you mentioned startup costs for that initial, what, what do you see that cost being, approximately? It, it's a good question. It, it really depends on the sh form that the uh, endeavor ends up taking. How we want, how the communities would like to structure their joint CCE plus, and what initial steps would be taken, and who would do that work. Uh, so it's, I could throw out a ballpark number, but in some ways that might be unfair to the process. Are we talking millions? No, no. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. All right, you don't want to do no. it. Right? <laughs> I should. I mean, I don't know if it's helpful to. We, just in response to that, it's my understanding <coughs> that um, uh, the 
there someone at UMass who oversees their sustainability programming that would be interested in um, kind of pitching into the consulting efforts and things? So there are ways to kind of piece things together um, so that it's not uh, an exorbitant cost to the city or to the whole group. Yeah. And to be, to be clear, what we're talking about today is basically an expression of interest in this concept and that's what the other communities have done. That's correct. Basically. Okay. So we had questions. Councilor Bidwell, the council budget. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks very much. Very, very good presentation. Um, it was part of the uh, initial phase of some sort of feasibility study, for lack of a better word, is just what the local generation capacity really is for, for, for renewables? Yes. Yeah, that's certainly uh, one, one direction to go in, where the communities engage in a feasibility study before any further steps are taken to authorize plan development and to actually implement an operating CCE+. Plus. Okay. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm kind of spiritually very much into the 100% renewable. My questions have always been economic ones, because heretofore green energy has been more expensive. And I noticed in one of the whereases, um, we say that it will bring tangible benefits to low-income residents and others who have been historically disadvantaged by fossil fuel-based energy systems. And, and this might be more for the sponsors. Can you tell me how low-income residents have been historically disadvantaged by fossil fuel-based systems? And given that renewable energy can be more expensive, how do we look out for low-income residents and seniors for whom utility costs are a major portion of their fixed incomes. You know, my, I, I certainly am in favor of renewable energy, but I, I wouldn't want it to have a negative effect on low-income people or seniors on fixed incomes since it has been traditionally more expensive than conventionally generated electricity. <coughs> Who wants to tackle? One, it's, it's opt-out, isn't it? Right. So it's not a mandatory thing. Okay. Any comment from the council? Well, I think um, Sam actually addressed a little bit about this, but one of the things that the CCE could do is actually create um, programmatic things that are put into place that allow um, low-income residents to get energy efficiency benefits. Um, we, we can do that now through, um, what is it called? Mass... Uh, Mass Save. Mass Save, thank you. Mass Save, but... Um, with the CCE, there are more things that can be built in that would support low-income residents. So, but Sam, you know more about the CCE structure that, that actually benefits low-income residents. So maybe you could yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's very specific to the goals that the, uh, the CCE establishes and then how it wants to use its ratepayer revenues. It could use some of them to subsidize electricity costs for lower-income residents and certainly um, assistance that they are low-income persons already qualify for uh, in Massachusetts they'd still be eligible for um, if you look at average CCE rates in Massachusetts in general during 2017 they're they're very competitive with the utilities basic rate um, oftentimes better than the utilities basic rate so um, the assumption is that the it, the uh, CCE would be providing a very competitive electricity rate to everyone and it could it could go further for low-income residents. But again, that, that goes back to the, um, to the design of the program and the goals that are written into its mandate. It's the, the, um, it is up to the CECE to develop the criteria by which um, adjustments and accommodations for uh, based on income would be made. It's up to the community priorities. So, and I think this is particularly it's particularly relevant now. Um, we subsidize, for instance, uh, supplemental energy or uh, fuel assistance for people with community development block grant funds. Well, the prospect of those are dimming. Those are federal funds. Also, uh, other federal subsidies to offset um, fuel costs for uh, people who are indigent are being rolled back. And this provides communities, the participating communities, more autonomy and and prioritizing people who are in <coughs> those pressures exist. Whereas the distance and the viability of uh, current systems for fossil fuels, not so good. 
Please go ahead. Oh, I, I just want to make sure that in our quest for 100 percent renewable, we don't result in an electric rate that is considerably higher and puts more strain on seniors on fixed incomes and low and moderate income people. I'd like to make sure that gets mitigated from day one so that it doesn't make it worse. You know, our interest in being green doesn't make it worse for vulnerable people. And as long as that's in there, I'm fine with it. And, and to that point, you're speaking to the resolution in toto. In total. And, and not, not uh, specifically to Sam's presentation. In Correct. No, yeah. I didn't, I, the, the, Sam did sp speak about this uh, issue with me earlier, and I'm totally comfortable with the, with the cooperative concept of this and another source for people to select in buying their <coughs> uh, It's I'm fine with that. It's just making sure that what has been in the past more expensive 100 percent renewable doesn't disadvantage seniors or low and moderate income people in our, in our quest to be green that we don't injure them with higher rates. But that's that is an appropriate caution to be sure. For, for myself, I am not an expert in this by any means, but um, it seems from what I recall reading that you can certainly make an argument also that over-reliance on certain fossil fuel energy sources like natural gas can kind of lead to volatility and price spikes, uh, especially around wintertime when um, everyone needs um, energy to heat their home. And I think that hits low-income people especially hard, and that goes to Councilor Dwight's point. Uh, when, you know, we start facing the prospect of losing LIHEAP funding from the federal government uh, to help people do that, which only pays for part of it anyway. So I think there's some volatility there that is troubling to me uh, in terms of the status quo. Any other discussion from the council? Council Sherry. Um, Sam, thank you for this. It was, uh, I talked to you before about this, and I, um, I appreciate all the work and effort that you put into this. Um, if we were to, to, um, collaborate with Amherst and Pelham and it was successful and it, everything went well it, would there be an opportunity for other communities to join is there a way for this to gr that collaboration to grow or would it, would this would be, be this kind of set group and then they would have to establish their own CCs yeah, that's a great question under the law as long as the entity starts out as a joint entity with at least two municipalities involved then others can join later on and so our vision is that it would start smaller because it's it's more manageable um, to get it off the ground, and then it would certainly be open to other communities joining, and there can be strategic advantages to scaling up and diversifying your electric load portfolio and having more consumers participating. Great. Uh, 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 a related question, follow up to that. The experience of the CAPE, what, what, what does that tell us? Did they start with just a few communities and, 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 and expand? What, what has been their progression over the years? Yeah, it's a great question. I believe they started off with the 21 member towns that currently operate that CCE. Um, I think there's a lot that we could learn from them, examples and lessons learned, and certainly we'd like our joint CCE plus um, to be tailored to the economic, environmental, and social needs of our local communities, which are somewhat different from the Cape and it's in terms of size and, and resources and so forth. But um, I think there's a lot to be drawn from that example that is certainly feasible. What they do is very different from sort of the traditional broker model that you see among many Massachusetts CCEs that simply procure electricity from competitive suppliers, hire a broker who charges a fee per kilowatt hour of electricity procured, and therefore has a financial disincentive to lower their energy consumption. The Cape Light Compact went in a different direction. It formed uh, an entity that was that it staffed itself with permanent staff from its inception so that it keeps all of its local ratepayer funds local. And it uses those revenues to pay for its staff and all of its operations. And it has traditionally focused heavily on en energy efficiency measures um, and achieved enormous benefits in that space. And more recently um, put energy into developing local renewable generation as well. So sort of phasing that in over time, which is I think how we envision this joint CCE operating as well. So I'd like to go to Councilor Klein and Councilor Dwight. So um, you're kind of talking about this, um, but I wanted to kind of home in a little bit more on um, something that I think a lot of people in Northampton have been worried about because of the model that we saw through HCOG, now HCG. And I'm just wondering if you can be a little bit more explicit in um, kind of delineating the differences between this kind of model and what we saw with HCOG. Yeah, 
two, I think four primary differences. The first is that HCOG's um, plan proposal was to develop individual CCEs within each participating municipality with no formalized mechanism for them to cooperate with each other, whereas our plan is a joint CCE that allows the communities to work together formally. Um, second distinction would be that HCOG's plan focused primarily on reducing electricity rates whereas ours focuses heavily on reducing greenhouse gas emissions while maintaining competitive electric rates. And we believe that by taking steps towards more energy efficiency and renewables, you will eventually stabilize and lower your long-term rates naturally. A uh, third distinction would be that HCOG's plan focused primarily on procuring uh, electric power from competitive suppliers, whereas our plan focuses on phasing in energy efficiency programs and development of local renewable generation. And the fourth distinction would be uh, that HCOG's <coughs> model was a broker model. HCOG was being compensated uh, on a fee per kilowatt hour of um, electricity procured, whereas we would be trying to keep those ratepayer revenues within the local communities by using them to staff the um, joint CCE rather than hire an outside broker. So, yeah. That's precisely what I was going to ask Sam to expand on. The one thing he's actually not mentioning is the fact that the Hampshire Council governments cast a very wide net and had to serve many, many masters, um, making it even more complicated and problematic. And then they ran up against the DPU, ultimately, um, with 86 the plan. This is. Um, this model has actually been established functions, as, as Sam mentions, on the Cape. And <laughs> as I mentioned briefly, the um, significant portions of the state of California have initiated their, their legislation. Ours is multiple pages long, I think, and theirs is a paragraph. But the, they, they actually have a very high functioning system of aggregation that returns a benefit that's adaptable to the communities that also focuses on um, <coughs> the reduction of greenhouse gases and improving efficiencies and conservation. <coughs> so philosophically, it coincides with everything that we've, we not only espoused in this resolution, but that we've espoused throughout the sustainable energy plan, the mayor's, uh, uh, this, is, this is part and parcel of the mayor's ethos as well, and as the community's ethos has been long since established, it, there, it conforms much more closely with what we, we have been discussing and envisioning. Thank you. Are, are we ready to proceed to a vote on this resolution, or is there other comment from the council? I would just make one final comment that, you know, as community members, we've worked hard to study this concept and try to answer these important questions. but. The reason that we're proposing this in the resolution is because it does need further study. And that's what we're asking the city to help out with. And so, you know, it's not, it's an, it's an ongoing process. And exactly what process that will take is sort of unclear today, but it's obviously going to include uh, the mayor's office. And, it's, you know, it's not just going to be the city council doing this. We're going to have a very uh, detailed look at, at this and see engage its feasibility. Okay. Uh, so with that, why don't we have a roll call on this resolution, please? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sam. Title. Thank you, Sam. Sam. Yes. 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 Okay. The resolution passes unanimously. Um, now we have a second reading of 17419. This is a resolution to support a $15 minimum wage. If there's no objection. I will waive the reading because it was read last time. Is there a motion to approve this? Move to approve. Uh, second. Is there a second? So made by Council Bard, second by Council Shera. Any discussion on this resolution or second reading? Um, oh, please, Council. I actually did want to say something. I didn't um, didn't share this last time. Um, <coughs> partly because it involves uh, me kind of sharing some personal information that I think will illustrate my thoughts about this particular resolution. Um, we had a, a discussion last time that was pretty robust, and one of the things that came up, um, especially for a couple of the counselors, was 
um, the question of whether or not we need to do some kind of tiering for um, younger workers, and that's something that we heard from um, Rich Cooper about, who owns Cooper's Corner and State Street, um, from Judy Harrell at mm -hmm. um, Harrell's Ice Cream. And I, those are people that I respect deeply, and I think you know they're running small businesses in this city, and they understand better than anybody else what the, um, what the pressures are in running those businesses. And at the same time, I have a personal experience that um, really informs my thoughts about that concept of tiering, and I wanted to share it. And it comes from my experience growing up. I um, actually worked from the age of 12 to help support my family and literally to put food on the table of my family. And um, was lucky enough to have a series of employers as a young teenager and an older teenager before I had to leave home um, that, that remunerated me commensurate with what I was doing and, and at the same rate that people older than me were making doing the same work. And, um, you know, I, I come from a family that was pretty ravaged by um, abuse and mental illness and it was me and my older brother that really had food on the table for the rest of my family. And we were the ones that made sure that my little brother wasn't hungry. And so I, I just, and then working over the years in social service kinds of jobs with people with HIV, people who use drugs, you see so often the kids and the families um, being the ones who, who are bringing home the bacon, so to speak. They're the ones that at their jobs at Burger King and other places are bringing home the money that really sustains the family. And so I feel really strongly that we have to remunerate people for what they do um, and that we can't, we can't create tiering systems that, that somehow diminish the importance of what the reason people are working. Um, you know, I spoke in, in the committee meeting when we talked about this in community resources about human dignity. And that's, that's kind of a broad concept and I'm speaking much more specifically about my own family's experience and the experience of families that I've worked with. But it really is about human dignity. If you're working, the best way that people can be kind of held up and supported <laughs> in their lives um, is, is for them to earn their livings and to be able to provide for their themselves and the people um, that they live with and the people that they love um, with dignity. And so I feel really strongly about this resolution. I'm very thankful to the co-sponsors for bringing it forward. And um, I just wanted to, at the same time that I recognize that um, there are imperatives for, for small business owners and there are struggles that small business owners are dealing with, I absolutely understand that. I also feel really strongly that workers really do deserve to um, receive a, a respectable minimum wage that they can um, support themselves and their families on. So that's what Thank I you. wanted to say. Thank you. Counselor. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Carney. Thank you. Thank you for those words, Councillor Klein. Um, I also uh, thought about this particular issue quite a bit because I too at uh, 14 started working in a nursing home uh, as a nurse's aide. And so was doing really uh, quite difficult work, you know, hard work for a teenager. And um, <clears throat> was uh, paid the minimum wage, I, you know, probably similar to uh, other folks, older number of whom were um, immigrants, <clears throat> doing the same work. And so, um, you know, some of the concerns I had about the tiering system are clearly that, you know, there's a competitive disadvantage that those who are placed, but those who uh, really are putting the food on the table for their homes or um, single heads of households who make up the majority of minimum wage workers would be uh, placed if there were uh, kind of a competitive lower <coughs> rate for uh, teenagers. 
Um, so I don't support that, and I just want to point out that it's not part of the state legislation that this resolution uh, supports. The state legislation doesn't make reference to a tiering system, and you know, just uh, looking at the wording of the resolution, we're looking to support the spirit of that resolution, which we know will be amended in terms of timelines and things like that. It also it points uh, uh, pointing out that with Raise Up Massachusetts, this was one of a package of a number of um, legislative initiatives that were signature drives. So, I mean, the possibility is is there could be theoretically three big um, signature uh, petitions on uh, the November ballot, and I think the hope is that if they can take care of some of these, specifically if this one can be taken care of in the legislative process in the state in the state house that would um, I mean there can be a lot of complications with having three big uh, citizen referendum on the ballot so I do support the resolution as I sponsored it and ask colleagues to support as well thank you counselor any any other comments from the council uh, Councilor Nash and Councilor Bidwell um, so I, I'd like to uh, support uh, what Councilor Klein was just mentioning about um, youth workers being paid fairly that you know the thing is when we enter the workplace where we get a job we're expected to perform that job is we regardless of our age we're supposed to perform the job and meet the job requirements that's how we are measured on the job and therefore to have some sort of scaled system that says well because you're of a certain age you don't get paid quite the same amount um, I you know I can't support that that concept. Um, I had another thought in there, but it's eluding me right now. But I, I think it was it, it's it's an excellent point, and um, I do know that it does create hardships. I was talking about this with Pat Patricia Crosby um, about you know how this could um, you know impact but you know youth workers, people with disabilities, that you know that it, it creates you know it's, you know can somebody meet the standard of you know what's required of being in in the workplace and um, you know that if somebody can do that they really should be paid the wage that they deserve so Councilor Bidwell uh, th those are all very compelling comments and, and, and thank you and I I recognize there's all of those problems with any kind of tiering system I, I it's probably not the solution I think the larger question is and I'll put in another plug for this uh, Senate task force public hearing on pressures on, on on small businesses basically is that small businesses that are faced with growing rents uh, and payroll pressure uh, and all the competitions uh, all the all the online competition and perhaps cas Springfield casino competition it's just part of a larger package of, 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 of very real pressure on, on on small business and so I I'm, I'm just glad there there, there is a, a, a a body that's specifically charged with looking at this. And one of those issues is is you know the pressure of of, of, of mandated increasing payrolls, which addresses a, a critical societal question, but it has consequences too. Any other thoughts, Councilor DeBarge? Yes, um, I want to thank Councilor Alyssa Klein um, for talking about when she was young and helping and support her family and putting food on the table. I can see where our small businesses in the city would have difficulties with going at $15 an hour. The tier system I thought was a really a good idea when Councillor Bidwell had brought that up. But I have to say, I think we need to be fair. It needs to be equal. And hopefully at the State House that they will attempt to try to work something out to help protect our small businesses. Thank you, Councillor. Any other comments? Councillor Murphy. And I'm, I'm going to continue to abstain um, for, for two reasons. First of all, somewhere I think between $13 an hour and $15 an hour, and Seattle's just getting there, so we would know from Seattle a little bit down the road, but somewhere between $13 an hour and $15 an hour, I think it's going to start to reduce these entry-level jobs. So 
some jobs will go away and some opportunities won't be had because of the economics of the rate of $15 an hour. And, and I'm, I'm certain that it's going to affect a small nonprofit that I'm involved with. I'm going to lose an employee at $15 an hour, plain and simple, gone. I know that. And it's going to happen to other, I mean, this is a nonprofit, but it's going to happen to for profits as well who have an income ceiling and it's going to cost them a person. And that's pretty devastating to lose your job. You know, <coughs> so maybe you're, you're making the minimum wage now, but you lose your job because they can't afford to pay you the new minimum wage. And I, I hate to see people lose that opportunity. And I think we'll know more from what's going on in Seattle a little bit down the road. But, but today I'm, I'm going to abstain. I'm, you know, I'm certainly not going to vote against it, but I'm not going to go along with it just because of those outstanding questions. And, and, and <coughs> I know it's going to cost somebody a job that I know. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, looks like we're about ready to proceed to a vote on this. Just, just briefly, what I was planning to say and actually wrote some notes was I was going to provide some, some facts and figures, and I f sort of feel like um, hearing the, uh, the very personal experiences of Councillor Klein and Councillor Carney and the, and the thoughts of other councillors, um, in a way, these, these figures seem somewhat pale. I was going to mention that on January 1st of this year, 18 states raised their minimum wages. Um, Massachusetts will not for the first time in four years. Uh, the states of Arizona, Colorado, Maine, Oregon, and Washington uh, approved minimum wages that are already above uh, the Commonwealth's $11 an hour minimum wage. And as I think some mentioned last time, California and New York are on their way toward a $15 minimum wage. Um, I was going to mention that with regards to possible job losses, you know, when we as a state uh, raised the minimum wage in 2014. Uh, the minimum wage in Massachusetts was $11 an hour. Um, since then, uh, employers have added more than uh, 211,000 jobs in Massachusetts. And, you know, it's a complex picture. You can't necessarily attribute one to the other, but that is an economic reality that there have not been devastating <coughs> economic losses in the state. In fact, you can point to some very uh, positive, salutary, uh, beneficial um, uh, imp impacts on the economy. Um, and finally, I saw just today that 39% of all Americans uh, have reported that they don't have $1,000 if something happens, you know, to their car, to their roof, um, something unexpected happens in their lives. They don't have the savings to be able to weather that storm. Um, you know, I think we see income inequality rising in the United States and right here in our home. And at the same time, we see the value of the minimum wage going down automatically because it's, 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 it goes down due to cost of living increases. So those are all facts and figures, but I have to say that, again, hearing Councillor Carney and Councillor Klein talk about their experiences, I have no doubt that what you're expressing is what many people are going through in their own lives. And that, for me, underscores the importance of uh, the City Council taking, taking a stance uh, on this issue. So with that, um, why, don't we, why don't we have a roll call of the Council, please? Okay. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lafarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. I abstain. Thank you very much. So that is approved unanimously. Uh, we come now to the consent agenda, which contains the following items. Uh, first, the minutes of January 2nd, 2018, our organizational meeting, and the following appointments. Uh, to the Council on Aging, Dennis Helmus of 176 North Street for a term of January 2018 to June 2021. To the Conservation Commission, Elizabeth uh, Roblica, uh, 406 North Farms Road, Florence, from January 2018 to June 2021. To the Energy and Sustainability Commission, Benjamin Wheel of 123 Audubon Road in Leeds from January 2018 to June 2021. And Ashley uh, Muspratt of 4 Fort Hill Terrace in Northampton, January 2018 to June 2021. And also 
um, uh, to the Public Shade Tree Commission, J. Gerard of 156 Ryan Road in Florence, from um, from the past, apparently, July 1st, 2017, to June uh, 30th, uh, 2020. Are there any removals from the consent agenda? Moved. Just a point, should it say these appointments referred to the Committee on City Services? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so a, a vote of, for these appointments will be equivalent to referring them to the City Services Committee. Thank you, Councillor. So the motion to approve the consent agenda was made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Dwight. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 No, the consent agenda is approved. And so now we will recess for the Committee on Finance. Can, Councilor Dwight. Can I actually call for a general recess? Oh, for sure. So let's really see. <coughs> Ten minutes. Ten minutes sounds perfect. Good. Okay, this is the Northampton City Council back again from our recess. And now it is time to recess in a different way uh, for our Committee on Finance. And so I'll turn it over to our temporary chair, uh, Councillor David Murphy. Thank you. And uh, this is the first official meeting. Yes. The first committee to actually get together because we get together in council. So um, would you call the roll of finance? Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Labarge. Present. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Shea. Here. And I believe, did we not survive the same as last time? Mm, okay. I'm new. You're new? Since you returned, yeah. Councillor Nash. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, Councillor. Oh, that's right. We lost Councillor Nash. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't lose him. He's <laughs> be coping with that. He's okay. broken up. He's, he's been, <laughs> he seems to be coping with that. Okay. Um, so the the first thing we need to do is an elect uh, is elected chair. So can we have a motion to open nominations? I make, I make a motion. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And do we have nominations? <coughs> I nominate David Murphy. <coughs> second. Do you have a second for that? All right, thank you. Do we have any other nominations? Move to close. Second. Move to close nominations. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, Move to elect con uh, Councillor uh, Murphy by a acclamation. Second. Uh, why don't we? Or if you want to have the roll call. Why don't we just call a roll call? That's easy to just call a roll call. Um, so uh, would you call a roll? Councilor Carney. Councilor Murphy. Councilor Labarge. Councilor um, Murphy. Councilor Murphy. Uh, I'll vote for Councilor Murphy. Councilor Murphy. I've had enough confidence to vote for myself since you've been kind enough to nominate <laughs> me. Um, and now uh, we should also elect a vice chair. So, uh, open nominations for that? Move to open nominations for vice chair. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Do we have a nomination for vice chair? Councilor. I'll nominate Councilor Kearney. Second. <coughs> Are there any other nominations? <coughs> Motion to close nominations. Move to close nominations. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, then would you please call uh, the roll for Councillor Carney? Sure. Councillor Carney. Councillor Carney. Councillor Labarge. Councillor Carney. Councillor Murphy. Councillor Carney. Councillor Shearer. Councillor Great. Thank you very much you. for your uh, for your confidence. And uh, so the next thing we need to do is approve the minutes <coughs> of uh, the previous meeting. Do we have those in our, our packets yet? Move to approve. Second, but can I also ask a point of order? Um, since I wasn't on the committee, what, what do we, I can't remember what we do about approving minutes when you were not part of the committee. If I may, yeah, you, you may abstain, you're not required to, if you uh, don't doubt the veracity of the minutes, you can vote yes, but feel free to abstain. Yeah. And though you weren't a member of the body, the meeting was held at council, so you were, you. I remember. You were a member of the body, but you were here for the meeting, so it's, yes. not, it's not something that you were not you know, you were not around. Um, so we had a motion, yes, and a, yes. And a second. Um, then if there's no more discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, so now it's time for, uh, if, if you'll all recall, um, Susan gives us, uh, our finance director, for those watching at home, uh, gives us 
quarterly financial <coughs> updates. And we're starting to get well along into the fiscal year, so there's more to talk about. Right. Well, not, not too much, um, but we're halfway through the year, and I gave you four reports, uh, revenues for the general fund, expenditures for the general funds minus the school budgets, and then revenues and expenditures for the enterprise funds. Um, the general fund revenues are on track. Um, there's really nothing um, terribly exciting to talk about. Some of the indicators that are that can be variable are the ones that have an economic um, component to them, like the meals and the hotel tax, um, motor vehicle excise tax. It's too early to tell where motor vehicle excise tax is going because we do the big commitment in February. Um, but as far as um, hotel, motel, and meals, um, hotel motel taxes are up $12,000 over the same time last year, which is about a 3% increase. And meals tax is up $32,000 over this time last year, which is about a 9% increase. So those are really good numbers, um, and those are ones that we would call economic indicators. Um, so other than that, everything else is pretty much on track. Um, building. Uh, department revenue is doing quite well as as well and that's another one that we would look at in terms of where the local economy is going so um, building permits plumbing wiring and uh, inspection services are doing quite well as well they're very busy um, so other than that there's not much to talk about in the revenues they're they're on track um, sit, likewise, with the expenditures in the general fund, um, all, almost all the salary accounts are either at 50% or slightly less if they've had some vacancies. Um, there really are no areas that I see of concern. Usually about this time I'll start doing a week, uh, bi-weekly payroll projection um, and running that after every payroll from now till the end of the year just to um, track to make sure the departments are on on budget and not seeing any spikes in overtime. So I don't usually start that until after the mid-year point. Um, in terms of the enterprise funds, they're also right on track. All of them have, in terms of revenue, brought in at least 50% of their revenues so far. Um, all of them are at 50% or slightly above. And their expenditures, again, are right on track. So there's really no areas of concern that I see. Um, the only thing is snow and ice. Um, if, you, if I go back to the general <coughs> fund and you look at the snow and ice halfway through the year, and that won't pick up the snowstorms that we just had, um, we're only 31% expended. But we've had, that was through December, so we've had some snow since then. So that's one that we're going to watch because we budget about 475 for that and every not every year but most years we do go over so um, questions for Susan on her quarterly report um, oh, counselor. Quick, quick question um, did the new parking system have an impact on parking revenue I'm just starting to analyze the the parking revenue um, in terms of um, usage, there's definitely an uptick in the number of people using the, the app um, and using uh, credit cards. So we're just try starting to analyze the cost of the, you know, the cost of the credit cards. I would say um, just the general trends is that parking revenues on or above where it was this time last year, ticket revenue is down. Um, there have been some times where the system has been down and the month of July was a little bit um, <coughs> hard to gauge because we were implementing the system then. So I do expect parking revenues to see a little dip this year just because of the implementation phase and because, uh, you know, credit card fees are going to take some of that revenue. But in general, the kind of the good news is that tickets are down, so we suspect <coughs> people are probably using the app so that they don't get a ticket um, or the system is convenient enough that if they don't have cash on them, they're not caught. They have their use their credit card so so I think so far we're seeing pretty positive things it's too bad there's no press here to note that you say ticket being down is a good thing yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. usually what people think yeah no we feel about that but. yeah no ticket ticket revenue is down <coughs> and, I, and, and it's I think in part because of people's the convenience of being able to pay thanks uh, are 
Are the ticket prices down commensurate with the amount of uh, parking uh, fees? So are the fines corresponding with the fees that drop in the? Again, I'm just starting to analyze the data. We okay. just, you know, six months of data just can't, you know, we just can't close right. December. So I haven't even had a chance to like put December in and get a six month picture. But again, we didn't start Park Mobile till September and the machines didn't get implemented till July, a little bit later. So, um, and we had some, you know, times when it ran, went down and I think we had some times in time in September another time in October so so I haven't got enough of a trend to say this is where it's going but you are seeing a, ro a relatively robust increase in uh, hotel and meals time. absolutely so you would think that that would be a corresponding right. yeah so okay. so I'll be looking at that now that I I was waiting for the data to come in because the deposits were made the last week of December or, or the first week of January, and they'll get credited back. And then I'll have a good six months to do a comparison. Any additional questions for Susan on her quarterly report? Generally good news for halfway through the year. <coughs> All right, we'll keep our fingers crossed. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next, next we have a number of um, appropriations for uh, the Preservation Act. And I see uh, Sarah LaValle in the back of the room. It's time to put her to work. Um, so the first one, we'll start going through them. Uh, they're all on the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. The first one is 18004. It's an order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for housing support services. Order that whereas the Northampton Housing Partnership submitted an application for Community Pre Preservation Act funding for housing supportive services, a program to continue to provide housing coordinator to work with low income housing residents to ensure that they're able to maintain tenancy. And whereas the project works to ensure that low and moderate income residents of Northampton are able to sustain and thrive within Northampton's community housing and um, has prevented 50 local evictions in three years that it has been in operation. Whereas the project is supported by numerous community stakeholders, including the Northampton Housing Authority, Valley CDC, Wayfinder Service Net, Home City Housing in Hampshire uh, County Housing Court. And whereas on November 15th, 2017, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $80,465 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to continue to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $80,465 be appropriated from the Community <coughs> Preservation Act uh, fund to the Northampton Housing Partnership for continuation of the Housing Supportive Services Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $58,000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve and $22,465 is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated uh, Reserve. Do we have a motion, Finance? Make a motion. Second. Second? Okay. And uh, Sarah, do you want to? come up and answer any questions that anyone might have and you do you, have, do you want to do a presentation on everything or do you want to do them as we go along oh we can do it as we go along okay. I have one slide for each presentation perfect just about. so just to start out um, this was a tough round this for, is the, for this the is CPC the, uh, first yes slide. so um, they had a lot of applications for much much more money than they had available unfortunately so it was a lot of difficult decisions had to be made um, so seven, seven, uh, 700, dollars in total funding recommendations this year, <coughs> and this is leveraging a, a lot of money from <coughs> many other sources and um, matching up on volunteer work. And getting to this project, the Community Housing Supportive Services, this was determined eligible as support of community housing. So this is a little bit different from a typical project where we're creating new units, but. The CPC felt that this was a really important project. Uh, 50 plus evictions were prevented in the first three years of the program, and many of these were from housing authority properties. So this is something that's really saving the city a significant amount of money in more ways than one. And this will allow the program to continue through FY 2019. This was funded back in 2014, and the city had looked for different ways to fund this program, and it, it's sort of an interesting niche. So there's not a lot of ways to do that but the cpc felt that it was really important to keep it going yeah and again, just to remind folks housing is one of the designated areas for cpc funding so the money has to be spent on housing 
It does, yes. So there's there's 10% the set aside that you approve at a different point in the year for community housing, um, historic preservation, and open space and recreation. So uh, questions for Sarah on this one? Councilor. Um, yeah, the, the housing coordinator that's really at the, the core of this. Uh, on whose payroll? Who, who's that person actually work for? Uh, she works for, I pay her invoices and I'm not going to be able to come up with the name of the organization, but it's a, uh, it's a nonprofit out of Springfield that specializes in, in this type of work and they manage a lot of other things wait, wait. as well. Not Wayfinders, um, it's an acronym. Did HAP? No. Uh, okay. But, but, but I, can, I can get it's, it. It's one of the nonprofits that's part of the housing partnership. It is, okay. yeah. Okay. I just, I just Any other? Uh, the, the, this is more generic, but they, I, I, and I know, as Councilor Murphy pointed out, that housing is one dimension <coughs> of uh, CPA uh, um, qualification. Sometimes we fall in proportionally a little lower on 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 housing and I know that the, this this time this round was a, a concerted effort trying to make to make an expanded uh, emphasis on 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 <coughs> promoting preserving and building new new housing is it am I understanding that correctly yeah that's correct um, the committee funded every housing request that came before them they weren't able to fund everything in, in its entirety but after a discussion with applicants they funded everything at a level that would allow the project to go ahead um, one that we'll discuss later the the community builders project on village hill that was given an initial fifty thousand dollars which will <coughs> allow the community builders to seek dhc tax credits and then they'll likely come back for additional cpa funds once they have those and the, the committee will most likely vote to award those at that time. And the, um, uh, the, the Valley CDC project is similar to that. There's a $300,000 uh, recommendation from the committee at this point, and last round the committee recommended an initial 50000 So that, that's pretty typical, they fund things. And, as they and when we say housing, just to, uh, so the public's clear on this, it's in, in our, our money is devoted towards uh, affordable and accessible housing. Um, and promoting that as opposed to um, less affordable development schemes and systems. Yes, uh, CPA funds are only allowed to be spent on funding for people making 100% or less of um, area median income. And generally the projects that the committee is supporting are, are much, much less than that. Thank you. Other, any other questions on this one? No, yes, good. All right, uh, near <coughs> and then, uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, the next one is 18005, <coughs> in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for restoration of the jail farm parcel uh, for use as agriculture. Order that, whereas the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding uh, for restor rest restoration of the three acre former jail farm parcel in the meadows and whereas the parcel is being provided to the city at no cost as as a state surplus property and a small investment of cpa funds will restore the long vacant farmland to working agriculture and whereas the parcel will be permanently protected through an agricultural preservation restriction and whereas on september 27th 2017 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the jail farm restoration project and the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the mayor, and the city council. Specifically, $3,000 is allocated from the CPA open space reserve. We have a motion to finance. So moved. Second. Great. All right, so this is an acquisition that City Council approved several years ago. It's a surplus property from DCAM. This was used um, by the Hampshire County. It was a jail at that point when they were still located downtown. They'd, um, the, they'd go out and grow things, but that was abandoned in the 1980s and it's been vacant ever since. Um, DCAM has been looking more at properties they own and, and trying to surplus things that they really don't need that are of more use to communities and this certainly fits the bill. Uh, so we're, for a really pretty small investment, this will allow the city to return this to active agriculture and license it to a farmer. Councilor LaBarge. How much is 
much clearing out as there needs to be done there? Uh, you can see in the picture that it's, it's grown up quite a bit. Uh, there's some encroachment from the farmer to the north, which is probably a good thing in this case, but there's trees that need to be cut down and some junk that needs to be removed. I mean, nothing too serious, but it still will take a little bit. Once it's cleared out, then what are we going to do with it? Then we will license it to a farmer, um, maybe an, an adjoining farmer, somebody who's looking to maybe develop a... <coughs> Any other? Uh, Council Scare? Um, and the, the $3,000 a small grant fund, is that <coughs> sufficient to clear that out and be able to lease it? Uh, we think so. It, it will be matched by $3,000 from the Office of Planning and Sustainability. <coughs> and there, it's, we're hoping to get some volunteer labor as well, so we're hoping we'll take care of it. So at one point there was discussion of having um, some uh, plots for gardening on that property and also access that linking up of, with other properties. Is that off the table for now or is the leasing it to farmers just a short term plan? Is there a longer term vision beyond, you know, just leasing it to farmers? Yeah, I mean, that, that's one idea. Um, there's certainly discussions that could be had regarding use of the property later, but we can't really have those discussions until we get the trees and all the trash off of it. So that will be something that will happen down the road. Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, thank you. I would just like to know a little bit more whatever you could say about the process by which um, the city will decide whom to lease this to and how that would, how would that work? It sort of uh, ties in with Councillor Nash's question, I sure. suppose, in a general way. So this property will be uh, controlled by the Conservation Commission, but managed by the Agriculture Commission. So that would be a discussion that would be held with that body down the road. Thank you. And if we lease it to a farmer, would those one of those entities become um, fiscally the, the entity that actually receives money from these individuals and keeps track of all that as a landlord? Wait. We've gotten away from taking monetary payments for these small agricultural uh, parcels. So we, in, in, instead of collecting 100 or $200 a year, whatever property is worth, we require the licensee to maintain and improve the property, which seems to be a better arrangement for everybody. So if it's somebody who's just looking to get into farming and they, they don't really have the funding available, that's, and that's a good arrangement for them, and it makes sense for the city as well. That's their, that's their compensation, and that gets us around our, the prohibition we would have on just giving something to somebody, yes. which we, we can't really ever do. Absolutely. Like the, the Elwell property, for example, the, the farmer there is required to maintain the gate and the roadway, which is a <coughs> significant cost that the city would have to cover otherwise. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions on this one? Uh, seeing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? But the next one is 18007. It's in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for the Mass Central Rail Trail extension. Six. Oops. Oops. We, oh, you know, these, I got to get used to the fact that uh, these are, they're printed back on the back, back now. They're back to, to back. back now. They take me out with that. <laughs> yeah, we did kind of jump right up to eight. Um, Again, still from Cons uh, Community Preservation Committee, eight, um, 18006, in order to appropriate com Community Preservation Act funds for open space acquisition. Order that whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission and Office of Planning and Sta Sustainability submitted an application for purchase of five open space parcels totaling 63 acres in the Mineral Hills and Rocky Hill Greenway, and whereas um, the Mining Heritage Project will provide opportunities for cultural and geological outdoor classrooms in what may be North Hampton's last example of an 18th century mine, and the Rocky Hill Greenway will add to the valuable wildlife and plant habitat linkage between Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary and the Connecticut River floodplain, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable North Hampton Plan, North Hampton Community Preservation Plan, and the Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan, uh, to protect open space, provide for passive recreation, and protect heritage landscapes. And whereas on November 15, 2017, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $125,412 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $125,412 be appropriated 
from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission and Office of Planning and Sustainability for the priority open space acquisition project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the Council. Specifically, $111,000 is appropriated from the CP Open Space Reserve and $14,412 is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve. Do we have a motion? Second. All right. All right, so both of the, well, all of these acquisitions actually were previously approved by council in 2017, so I won't go into them in too much detail. Um, but the areas include opportunities for trail and wildlife connections and views and a historic lead mine as well, which is really pretty cool. I've tried to take pictures of it, but you just can't get the scale in the photo, so I'd be happy to take you out for a visit once we do acquire it. Um, and we're requesting two readings to allow closings to occur. The sellers have been uh, really willing to work with us so far, but it's getting to be a really long process, so we'd, we'd like to close and, and do two readings if possible. Uh, questions? Uh, Council Who are we purchasing the property from? Uh, the mining heritage site is, oh, I, I've moved on to other acquisitions, so I don't have them on the top of my head anymore. Um, None. Then all in favor of the positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> so now we go to 18007, which is the Preservation Act funds for the Mass Central Rail Trail Extension. Order that whereas the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for continued construction on the Mass Central Rail Trail in Leeds, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Northampton Sustainability Plan. Um, and open space recreation multi-use trail plan and whereas the project has wide community and regional support and will bring the trail to the Williamsburg town line and whereas CPA funds will be used to match uh, as a match for federal recreation trails program grant funds and whereas on November 15, 2017 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $50,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Mass Central Rail Trail Extension and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the Council. Uh, specifically, the $50,000 is allocated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve. Do we have a motion of finance? Make a motion. Second. Second? All right. Before I start this one, William Walker, trustee. Is the was the current owner of the mining heritage property? Uh, so I we've been Wayne and I have been before you many times with this project as the as the trail continues its very slow march towards the Williamsburg line. Uh, I like to use this picture because it it shows what happens when we ran out of funding for the project. So there's a beautiful trail and then it just stops and it's sort of a mud hole. So this will match fifty thousand dollars in federal recreational trails program funds. Williamsburg also received a fifty thousand dollar grant, so we'll be working with that community to maximize all of our funds and hopefully have a ribbon cutting at the town line very soon. Excellent. Excellent. Council of Arch, you had a question. I think this is great that um, we're going to go ahead and expand <coughs> up to the Williamsburg town line. And if you just like during spring, straight through the summer, I mean, up, up in Leeds once, twice a week, my husband even more than that because of family there, and the amount of people using that trail, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's really nice. And the views, especially this time of year, when also when there's no mosquitoes of the Mill River, <laughs> are really beautiful. Well, there are certainly no mosquitoes out there today, that's for sure. Um, other questions for Sarah on this one, Councilor Bidwell. And once at the town line, then 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 what? Williamsburg is has been developing their portion of the trail, and they're also working for a safe access off of the goat path, as they call it, um, down onto the roadway, and then north towards Williamsburg Center. They have some challenges along Route 9 because that roadway has, has been expanded widthwise basically as much as it, as it could. Uh, so making that access safe is a challenge, but they're working hard on it. But they've got site control? Uh, for the goat path area, at least to get onto the roadway, they do, yes. Any other questions for 
Sarah, on this one. Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. All right, we're on to 18008. This is an order to appropriate Community Present Act funds for the Sergeant House expansion project at 82 Bridge Street. Order that whereas the Valley Community Development Corporation submitted an application to Community Preservation Act for funding for the Sergeant House expansion at 82 Bridge Street and whereas the project will increase and improve the number of affordable rental units at the existing property from 15 SRO occupant units to approximately 30 enhanced single room occupancy units, including units accessible, un un ex units accessible units, units for the homeless and for the Department of Mental Health, and will also rehabilitate a historic structure, whereas the project was reviewed and approved by the Northampton Historic Commission and is listed as a contributing property to the pending Pomeroy Terrace National Register Historic District, and whereas suitable affordable housing, uh, especially single room occupancy housing, uh, and of that type is in demand locally and regionally and whereas the housing units will be restricted to individuals earning 60% of the area median income or below and whereas the city has already supported the project through a $50,000 CPA award and a 40R zoning overlay and the project will leverage funds from a variety of other sources and whereas on November 15th 2017, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that an additional $300,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $300,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Valley Community Development Corporation for Sergeant House Expansion Project for Historic re Rehabilitation and Capital Repairs to 82 Bridge Street and the Expansion of Affordable Housing and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the Council. Specifically, 75,000 is appropriated from the CPA Historic Reserve and 225,000 is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. And a second? Second. All right. So this is the second time that this project, is, actually the third, the third time that this project is coming before Council once for an initial $50,000 recommendation from the, from the Community Preservation Committee to demonstrate local support for tax credit applications, which have since been received. And then it came before you again for a 40-hour zoning approval. Um, so this will create really needed single room occupancy, very low affordability units, very close to downtown, and also rehabil rehabilitate a historic structure. This is located within the Pomeroy Terrace National Register District, which should be approved by the Park Service sometime this spring, so that's moving forward. Um, the committee really, really liked, liked this project a lot, um, and they awarded Valley CDC the full amount that they requested. Uh, I think this is just fantastic. We're going from 15 to 30. I mean, we're in dire need in this city for SROs, and I think it's well worth with CPA money to support this. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a great uh, set of housing and it's close to downtown, but they really need a lot of work and this is a really ne needed project. Um, Ms. Valley, do you know the total cost for this phase of the project that we are contributing this $300,000 to? This will be the entire build out of the project. So there's no other cost that they're bearing? I mean, you mentioned they had received other funding um, from other, from the state, I think. Uh, so do you know the total budget? Because the total budget isn't, isn't $300,000. No, no, it's, yeah. it's significantly more than that. It's many millions of dollars. I don't have the exact number in front of me, and I, it had been changing a little bit during the application process, but it, it's many million dollars. That's okay. It, it lets me make my point that um, the $300,000, which sounds like a lot, is being leveraged many times over it is yeah. so that's just one of the things that spending cpa money on housing that's one of the benefits of doing that we're spending three hundred thousand but we're it's for a project that um, essentially leverages much more money that's not city money it is so and, and i just wanted to point that out because i think that is a very good thing about this project the development of these types of project is, projects is incredibly expensive, um, both for the, the capital cost and also the long-term affordability. That you know, that's a decrease in the property value going forward, and the city's contribution per unit is really incredibly low for this project. So we're seeing a lot of value out of that. 
Thank you. Uh, um, so this is great, obviously, because it's it's a twofer, as you noted. It it hits both historic restoration and affordable housing. Um, how did the committee come up with um, <coughs> the seventy five thousand fr from the historic uh, reserve fund? Is there is there some sort of calculus that we use to determine? So the the committee asked for some information from the applicant about how much of the project uh, could be attributed to historic preservation. They came back with a number that was much much larger than this. And the, the reason that this particular number is being used is basically because that's what they needed to make the numbers work for this funding round. Okay. Any additional questions on this one? Okay, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Okay. All right, this is 18009 in order to appropriate CPO, uh, CPA funds for affordable housing as part of Village Hill Apartments. Uh, whereas the community builders submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the creation of affordable housing units as part of the Village Hill Apartments, and whereas the project will create approximately 65 units of mixed income rental housing at Village Hill on two parcels, and 35 of these will be restricted to households uh, and individuals earning 60% of the area median income or below, and whereas open space and playgrounds uh, a part of the project will be open and available for use by the public and whereas the community builders has an excellent record providing affordable housing in Northampton and beyond and whereas the project will leverage funds from a variety of sources and whereas on November 15th 2017 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $50,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project now therefore be ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the community builders for Village Hill Apartments project and that the grantee meet the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the mayor and the council. Specifically, the 50,000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve. We have a motion. Have motion. Second? Second. I did have a slide for this project, which has apparently been eaten by PowerPoint, but basically was just showing the location of the project in Village Hill. So this is the last significant residential development on the north side of Village Hill. So if you're looking at the, the area, it's everything that's, that's undeveloped on the, the north portion. Um, and an, an initial commitment of 50000 is being recommended to demonstrate local support for this project that's creating 35 units of income-restricted community housing at Village Hill. It received a, a lot of support from the neighborhood. Um, this probably won't be the last time that this project will be before you, but the community builders agreed that this was enough to demonstrate commitment as they go for their tax credits and other applications. Mm -hmm. Questions? Council Robot? Yes. 65 units of mixed income, rental housing on two parcels. How big are the parcels? Uh, the, the north parcel is very large. It's 15 acres or so. Um, <laughs> The other parcel is right next to the, the new Columns building, where the male attendance building has been renovated. That's a much smaller parcel. Their headquarters will also be located there. So 35 of these will be restricted to households and individuals earning 60% of area medium income or below? Yes, that's correct. So that uh, the CPA would allow funding to be spent on anything that's 100% or below this, but this is even significantly below that. And they're also saying that with the three open space and a playground open for the use of the public? Yes, that's correct. Um, there will be, there's, will be protected open space along the, the Mill River that will be available for use as well as a playground that they've indicated will also be available for public use. Other question? Well, well there, there, there's many things I liked about this this, this project. I, it was really excellent. The state selected uh, community builders as, mm -hmm. as, as the developer. Here. There were there were numerous proposals for market rate housing. And uh, as the last uh, residential development site, as you say, up in, up in Village Hill, I think this is uh, it's, it's tremendous. And I was very glad to see such enthusiastic abutter and, and neighbor <coughs> support for this. And I'm also very happy that there's going to be some, you know, playground as part of this too. Right? Is this? It, it's it's really become for, for folks who have not been up to look, drive around Village Hill or walk around or bike around in a while. It is quite remarkable how 
in the larger scheme of things in a relatively short period of time a quite remarkable and now fairly complete feeling community exists up there and this is a really nice kind of capstone to it all so I'm delighted that we can add some support to it um, of the 35 units uh, do you know roughly what size those units are going to be are they um, will they be um, <coughs> families uh, that I don't know. It, the project was approved by the planning board two weeks ago, so those, that some of that information should be available in those documents. But I, okay. I would think that the community builders is probably still fine tuning exactly how big the units will be. Do you know if they're all the same size? They are not. As okay. as Any other questions on this one? No? Hearing right. none. Then all in favor of positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. 18. 010 in order to appropriate CPA funds to the Conservation Fund. Whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the Conservation Fund, and whereas the fund makes possible increased acquisitions or protection of open space parcels in Northampton by supporting fast action on time sensitive real estate opportunities and placement of permanent conservation restrictions, and whereas the project may leverage additional public and or private funds, and whereas the project meets the goals of the Northampton Sustainability Plan for Protection of Open Space and Agricultural Lands, and whereas the applicant has used these funds effectively in the past towards the protection of several hundred acres of open space, reflecting the goals established by the Community Preservation Committee, and whereas all lands purchased will be reviewed and approved by the Conservation Commission and the City Council, and whereas on November 15, 2017, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $50,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Fund and that the grantees meet the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. We have a motion? Second? Second. All righty. All right, so no slide for this one, but if we were to make a slide, it could essentially be everything that the CPA has ever put it's done so far yeah, yeah. Um, most of the open space acquisitions that have taken place wouldn't have been possible without this fund it allows for due diligence and quick action and implementation of CRs and just all of the not that exciting stuff about land acquisition to take place this one and we've seen this we've seen this and not we've seen this go by enough and we know that it's worked and we're all comfortable so uh, positive recommendation finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. All right. And uh, the next one is 18011 in order to appropriate CPA funds um, for uh, Habitat for Humanity on Garfield Avenue. Order that whereas Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for construction of an affordable single family home on Garfield Avenue and whereas the project will provide an energy efficient ownership unit that is harmonious in design with the existing neighborhood and suitable for a small household and whereas Habitat for Humanity has an excellent record of creating housing throughout the Pioneer Valley and beyond whereas the project has wide community support leverages funds from many other sources and utilizes volunteer labor and whereas the home will be restricted to an individual uh, or families earning 60 percent of the area median income or below and whereas on November 15th 2017 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend twenty thousand dollars in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project now therefore it be ordered that twenty thousand uh, dollars be appropriated from the Community Preservation <coughs> Act fund to Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity for Garfield Avenue affordable housing project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, the $20,000 is appropriated from the CPA undesignated reserve. We have a motion? Second. Okay. All right, so Garfield Avenue is located just uh, north of Route 9, east of Florence. It's a great location near the bike path. Um, this is in a neighborhood that has several Habitat for Humanity homes already, so every lot shown on uh, the survey except for lot 1a which is the subject property is a habitat for humanity house um, ha habitat for humanity as you all know is a great organization that uh, with the help of a lot of community input creates uh, affordable home ownership units which are 
challenging to find um, locally. Um, this was a lot that was subject to the small lots big ideas competition. The ultimate owner decided to donate it to Habitat for Humanity. They thought that was a fitting use for it, so Habitat is coming in to do this one last lot on Garfield Avenue. Has anybody been up there to see those? You've no. seen them? Yeah, seen them? No. Councilor Barr, do you have a I've question? Yeah. Do you have a question? Or? No. no. Anyone have a question on this? All right. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 <coughs> and our last one is 18012 in order to appropriate CPA funds for three uh, Habitat for Humanity affordable houses on Glendale Road. Or that whereas uh, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the creation of three affordable single family homes on Glendale Road. Whereas the project is a collaboration with the City of Northampton will provide energy efficient ownership units that are harmonious in design and scale with the existing neighborhood. And whereas Habitat for Humanity has an excellent record of creating housing throughout the Pioneer Valley and beyond. Whereas the project has wide community support levels from many other sources and utilizes labor. And whereas the homes will be restricted to individuals and families earning 60% of the area median income or below. And whereas on November 15, 2017, the Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $60,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used in support of this project. And though therefore it be ordered that the $60,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding uh, to Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity for Glendale Road Zero Net Affordable Housing Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, the $60,000 is appropriated from the CBA Affordable Housing Reserve. We have a motion in finance. Second. Second. All right. So uh, it's slightly larger dollar amount because there are three units instead of one with this project. This was part of a municipally sponsored limited development project for the former Kensington Estates on Glendale Road and West Hampton Road. Um, lots one through. Uh, lots two, three, and four on this map are the, the subject properties, and the shaded area is now permanently protected conservation land. Um, this map shows what it would have looked like with the previously approved subdivision. Um, the Community Preservation Committee thought this, again, was a, just a great project to provide home ownership units in, in a neighborhood where it can be tough to obtain those for uh, those with low incomes. Uh, Councilor Marsh. houses with the 50 acres of open space and three homes and one was supposed to be handicapped accessible is that still in the plants I believe it is that was supposed uh, to be in the first house because it's closer to the yeah it didn't specifically come up during the discussions but if that was part of the initial agreement I'm sure that's something that habitat is planning on um, they are at our meetings they're working on a, a different type of housing rather than, than doing from the ground up stick built housing. They're going to, they're looking at uh, mobile units, which are really energy efficient and come at a significant cost savings. And those may all actually be handicapped accessible, but that's something I'd have to check with Habitat on. Another question? Councilor Scare? Yeah. Um, sorry, is there something magic about $20,000 for, for a Habitat unit? It's, so these, there are four. That we're voting on tonight, and so they each come out to twenty thousand. Is that what they asked for, or is there a reason why? That's what they requested. Okay. Uh, I don't know if how their magic formula worked out okay. for these projects, <laughs> but that's what they needed to make the projects work. Okay. In this case, thanks. Any other questions on on this one? Then, hearing none, your night's drawing to a close here, Sarah. Uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? None. And uh, that is the end. Uh, end of our agenda I think for tonight so uh, there are no since this is our first meeting there's no other business so a motion to adjourn to adjourn uh, I'm happy to stick around for the full council discussion if you'd like me to if nothing will come up then does any councilor request that no. no so thank you very much for all your time thank, thank you. you all right uh, so all in favor of adjournment aye aye, okay. aye. aye. Okay. and we are back to the full City Council and we first come to item 18004 in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for housing support services. First reading. Move approval. Move approve. Second. Made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Barge. Any discussion on this order? 
a roll call whenever we can. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, I did. <coughs> Yes. 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 Okay, the next is uh, 18.005. In order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for restoration of the jail farm parcel to agricultural use. First yes, reading. Sir. Made by Councilor Clark. Seconded by Councilor Klein. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. 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 Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Now we're at 18.003 in order to appropriate Community Preservation Act funds for open space acquisition. Second. Made by Councilor Bard, seconded by Councilor Klein. Any discussion? I think they want two readings. I believe Council. they did want two readings on this. But here in our first reading, uh, roll call, please. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Hardy? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Suspend rule 14. Motion to suspend rules. Second by Councilor Klein. Um, any discussion on the suspension of rules? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Votes no. Rules are suspended. Is there a motion to approve on second reading? So moved. Second. Councilor Dwight, second by Councilor Barge. Any discussion? Um, let's have a roll call, please. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. And Councilor Lamont? Yes. That is approved on second reading. Uh, now, 18.007, in order to appropriate CPA funds for the Mass Central Rail Trail Extension. So motion to approve this. Motion so to moved. Move to approve. Made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on this order? Roll call, please. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Order 18.008, in order to appropriate CPA funds for the Sargent House expansion project at 82 Bridge Street. Move to approve. Um, made by Councilor Klein, second by Councilor Bidwell. Any discussion on this? Real quick. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, compliment Valley CDC on the outreach that they did around this project, that um, they, um, you know, did. It was exhaustive and that, you know, as the Ward 3 counselor, I'm 100% behind it. And it's, it's going to be terrific. It's going to be really great. That's all. Great. I echo your comments as the former Ward 3 counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Any other discussion? Um, roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. 18.009, in order to appropriate CPA funds for affordable housing, <coughs> excuse me, as part of the Village Hill Apartments. Made second. Councilor Dwight, second, excuse me, made by Councilor Bidwell and seconded by Councilor Dwight. Any discussion on this? Um, roll call, please. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Yes. 18.010, in order to appropriate CPA funds to the Conservation Fund. Move to approve. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? If not, a roll call, please. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor <coughs> Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. 18.011, in order to appropriate CPA funds for Pirate Valley <coughs> Habitat and Humanity Home on Garfield Avenue, first reading. Is there a second? Okay, um, made by Councillor Klein, seconded by Councillor Shara. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. 
Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Yes. 18.012, an order to appropriate CPA funds for three Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity affordable homes on Glendale Road. First Move reading. To approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lamar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you. We're up to orders. We're at 18.0. One five in order to make various amendments to the council rules. Is there a motion on this one? So order? moved. Second. So this is a motion to approve, and it's on <coughs> order. Any discussion of this order? The sponsors care to. Oh, well, I was going to say, I, um, you, if the if the sponsors would share with us, <coughs> please, that would be appropriate. Intent and purposes. I'd be I'd, I'd be glad to, and uh, I don't know if you want to take these as a group or uh, we talk about them individually I uh, contemplated a referral to legislative matters in any yes. event, but a referral might be in order at some point but but can offer just a little bit of introduction please, please do yes uh, I guess s several of these are well to be specific the, the additional language about uh, committee study requests and the uh, additional language about uh, referral of matters to committees is just based on on what I think would be uh, uh, the desirability of, of, of having a few more matters that come before this body uh, referred to committee for investigation for inquiry for receiving testimony from a, a, a broad range of, of stakeholders into just encourage further deliberation uh, <coughs> before we as a body take take votes on matters so that was the, the the motivator behind both the additional language on committee study request and the uh, the, the the reference to referrals to uh, of further matters to uh, to committees and, and I'll just say a word about the other two and then let my co-sponsors say what they would like to say um, there was a time when our council rules um, said that uh, once a year the council would adopt by resolution uh, its legislative agenda. In other words, the, the matters that we as a council would like to see our, our legislators take up. Um, we never did that, at least in my short time here. And that, that rule was stricken. But I do think there would be some value in having at least once a year perhaps twice a year a discussion a discussion involving the mayor about what are the mayor's state legislative priorities <coughs> just so we all as counselors uh, have some have some sense of, of, of what the mayor's priorities are all of us at one time or another have a have occasion to find ourselves in the company of representative Cocott or senator rosenberg and it always seems to me a little bit ad hoc as to what I what I use that five minutes for to talk to him about I think it'd be interesting to just have a little more cohesive sense of of priorities and I've discussed this with with the mayor and he would entertain the notion of engaging the council in such a conversation uh, and finally uh, on on conduct I've suggested some 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 language that adds a little bit to civility and, 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 and respect um, uh, in, in, in public uh, in, in public comment uh, I think it's fairly fairly uh, benign language um, that uh, uh, would of course always be at the discretion of the presiding officer to to uh, enforce but I would I would encourage us to, to consider that additional clarifying language Leave it to others to weigh in. Um, Councilor Shara, would you like this? Um, yeah. So, um, in terms of the state legislative priorities, um, I, I I would like to resurrect what I think was a good idea originally by Councilor O'Donnell um, that that never was was used. But um, I've just noted in the past, uh, let's say the past term, we've had quite a few resolutions that were focused on state legislation um, or that were about matters that were. 
um, for example, the Charter School Expansion, School Bus Safety, Pregnant Workers Fairness, Medicare for All, Safe Communities, we just had one tonight, $15 minimum wage. Um, and some were driven by community members, some were, um, were initiated by counselors. And I, I feel like at this moment, there's an increased interest in state legislation as we try to protect or assert ourselves against the federal situation. Um, and the mayor does a great job of lobbying for Northampton, and I think that we could have a very informative conversation with him about what he sees on the horizon and, and what part we could take in that. Um, uh, in terms of um, the <coughs> language about, I guess let's say, decorum in the chambers, um, you. I've, this is something I've sort of complained about recently. Um, I, I'll just note from my seat that when there are conversations or banter or, um, or exclamations, that it's extremely hard for me to hear council discussions. This actually happened like quite a few times tonight. And it's really, I don't know if it's something about my seat or the acoustics, but I can hear every, I can, I can tell you the conversation that the mayor had with Sam at one point. I can hear everything. And so it's hard, I'm sorry, Sam. Um, so I would like us to find a way to maybe make this, uh, you know, make a situation where everyone can hear. And, um, and I, you know, I appreciate people's enthusiasm, um, but it is disruptive and it's not always momentary because sometimes um, these sort of moments of celebration splinter off into conversations. And, um, and it's usually at, at the conclusion of a matter for that group, but it's rarely at the conclusion for us. And, um, and that's, I think we need to be able to hear what's going on. Just another case in point is that at the, uh, our last meeting, I actually didn't hear the motion to adjourn and didn't vote. I had no idea it happened until I turned to Councilor Dwight. Mm -hmm. So I, we shouldn't be conducting business if we can't hear. Um, and I think the council president has often asked members of the public to refrain from shows of approval or disapproval. Um, and, <coughs> and I don't expect that us putting it into the rules are gonna change that behavior, but um, I do find it's helpful to be able to point to something to say that it's explicitly our policy. Um, and it also makes it clear that we're not calling out a specific person, again, sorry, Sam, um, or it's not directed at you know a certain group or, or a person, that this is just our standing rule for all. Um, then um, moving on to 5.2.1, this is maybe the most minor change um, but it's, it's perhaps the largest discussion and maybe this isn't the time to have it if we're gonna, if there's an idea that we may refer this, because it, it's sort of, that's what it's about. Um, but this proposal is just like a slight emphasizing of what is already in our rule, which is that generally matters before us may be referred. Um, and that's any matter, not just binding legislation, and they may be put up for a vote, um, they'd be put up for a vote for referral to committee or, or commission. Um, but it's come that that uh, that's come up a couple times recently, and um, there's been some discussion about it and questioning specifically about whether it's appropriate to refer resolutions. And I think that this is an opportunity to have a fuller discussion about um, about that. So again, I, it doesn't have to happen now if we're going to refer it. But I have other thoughts on that. Um, but that's that's my impetus for this. Thank you very much, um, Councilor Nash. Is the other sponsor, Councilor Lavarge after. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, the, the first thing I'd, I'd like to speak to is the uh, 4.7 demonstration of members of the public, and um, that uh, you know. Last, so last week, while I was speaking, there was quite there was a very vocal response to my rhetorical question that did answer my question, <laughs> but that. Um, that were I, you know, so much in the zone of my own thoughts, it probably would have thrown me off track, mm -hmm. and that, um, and I think that's basically what we're trying to avoid here, and I, you know, and that I realize that there's times where you're watching the golf, you know, the golf match, the tennis match. That's what we're doing here, rather than the baseball game or the football game, you know, where the, the you know, the people present are to be, you know, quiet and respectful. And, um, and I get that sometimes, you know, that the emotions get you. I, I understand that. But I, I think it's good that we, we outline that so that, um, that our deliberations don't get interfered. Uh, um, so that's to that point. Um, as far as uh, the, um, 
you know, connecting up the work that we do, especially around resolutions with the, uh, with what's going on at the State House, I think it's critical because, um, first of all, us getting feedback is, is a really good thing, but also when we're sending it back towards the State House, that it's actually something that our representatives, they, they can put those resolutions in their hip pocket, in their hip pocket and, um, and it, it becomes part of their ammo to make their case. So um, I, I, I think that's a terrific idea. Um, and as far as, you know, this, referring things uh, out to committee, I think that what, what's, what's difficult, I mean, and we saw a lot of this over the, the last four, it seems like 10 months of, you know, uh, people, uh, once, it, once things are at this level, it's hard to, inter rules prevent us from interacting. And that, um, and I was just talking about it with uh, Jess and Sarah out in the hall that isn't this so much nicer? We're just talking right here, uh, you know, that, you know, for, for f four months, oftentimes, you know, it's been a one-way street where, you know, we're deliberating, they're over there, they're talking at us. And the great thing about committee is that interaction can happen. And that, um, and I, you know, I'm, and, and in fact, I, I, I tell people that, you know, if you want to affect what goes on at council, you have to get stuff at committee. Once it gets here, then, you know, it, 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 it's a much harder thing to uh, have your, um, your voice impact the, the, the legislation. Um, so, um, so things going to committee it, is, is terrific. Um, and I think that's all I'll say for right now. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Barr, did you have? Yes. Um, I like this idea, um, like with our state reps, Senator Rosenberg. About three years ago, I asked about that. It would be great if we could have that visibility. So I'm glad that language is in there. I also do agree about conduct. I really had a hard time with a bunch of people sitting around in the back of me and clicking their fingers, which affected my hearing aids terribly. And I have to say that our counselor at large, Bill Joy, handled it in due respect. And I just think that I hope I don't see that happen again. Thank you. Any other comments, Councilor Boyd? I, I am interested in having this referred. Uh, but beyond that, I would also, I mean, actually more to that point, uh, the additional 4.7, the addition of 4.7. When I, the very first act that I had proposed, the very first rule change I proposed when I got elected, what, 16, how long ago? 16, 17, 18 years ago, whatever. A long, long time ago was to call for more decorum and civility within the chamber. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, there was pronounced antipathies expressed by counselors yes. towards the mayor. Audience screaming, yelling, demonstrations, protestations. Um, it made what you've experienced recently look like a tea party. Um, there was lots of drama. The mayor would had walked out at one point. I remember uh, the mayor. The mayor left in tears. There were physical threats, and I proposed. Oh, and that, and as a new counselor, that kind of shook me to the core. It disturbed me, and I proposed um, a civility rule. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because my my. Thoughts on that have evolved over the over the year. Um, there was pushback actually from the ACLU. It was the uh, Bill Newman actually, and among others, that said um, it is laudable to aspire to that. It is wrong to codify it in some way. To to codify the uh, you know telling people they can't demonstrate or perform demonstration. We also when I, the, I mean, I think within the first few weeks of when I got reelected uh, for my second run, we were occupied. Um, I remember. Uh, which point the whole 
the whole system was completely disrupted. Uh, the mayor had the option of actually gaveling the meeting to a close. Um, did not, he chose not to. Um, but we actually strayed from the rules. But the, but the mayor, who was a presiding officer, in both instances when I was introduced, when I was, these disruptions occurred, managed it in their own way, given, and making accommodations and exceptions. My concern with this, this kind of amplification of what we already basically do is, when I did as council president, which you have done as well, which is to make a gentle request to respect the decorum of the chamber. When we make it a rule that you cannot demonstrate, then you've, you've done, because what we're doing here is the people's business. We may, it, it may, it does affect and impact how we conduct the people's business. But I don't know if necessarily it is something that we want to diminish in any way. I mean, one of the things that would, the lamentable parts that uh, Councilor Nash referred to is you can't have that free exchange. It is true, we are limited in some respects by our own rules on our conduct. But at the same time, we can, we can at least under uh, the rules of free speech, say horrible things to each other, have horrible fights, uh, be ad hominem as much as we want, because it's not precluded. We ask that we respect the decorum, but we don't require it. And when we start to require it, I think we run into trouble. I think we actually then, we start, we start pushing them away and in the name of us doing efficient business. And that's why I, you know, if we, if I'd like to flesh out this thought in this conversation, it's just a, my initial response to uh, my first reading of this, the first action time I've read this. Um, I think the legislative priorities uh, addition is actually perfect. I think it's a great workaround for what we were trying to achieve but did not and didn't manage to do. As far as any council referring any matter, I have no problem with that. I do have a problem if it's used as a tactic, but then and there it is. If it is a tactic, it's a tactic. We just, we, we have lots of parliamentary procedures that can be maneuvered and used as tactics. Mm -hmm. It doesn't subvert or necessarily stop or prevent a law or a resolution, but at the same time, I mean, I, my preference would be that they be referred to for actual <coughs> Any other comments? Councilor Klein. Please. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of going to echo what Councilor Dwight just shared. I had a real reaction to that one um, piece around uh, kind of strengthening the, the civility piece. I think... Um, I think it's up to the council president as the presiding officer to, um, don't want to echo you exactly, Councillor Dwight, but to gently um, remind mm -hmm. folks that we need to be able to hear that um, something might be rude. But to me, what's so important about us as elected officials is that we are interacting in vibrant ways with the public and with our constituents and with people on issues that they really care about. And that's not to say that I think it's okay for people to be rude or nasty, but I think um, when you sharpen language too much, it, it, it has kind of ripple effects. It has meaning for people that makes them feel shut down. And the last thing I want to do is shut down the conversations and shut down people's sense of um, their ability to engage with us in whatever ways they want. If it's truly impeding our process in some way, I think that would be the council president's job to, or you know, we had um, Councillor Shera one day um, couldn't hear and said something, and I think that was totally appropriate. Um, but to codify it feels like we're, you know, the teachers and we're waggling our fingers at the, the you know, the, the problematic children. And I, I, I don't like the tone of the language, to be perfectly direct and honest about it. So that was my feeling about that one. Um, 
the legislative bringing uh, the mayor in to, to talk about state legislative priorities, I think it's a great idea. Um, one thing, though, that I, I'm kind of playing with an idea in my head, which may be taking this to a place that the sponsors don't want to go, but I'm thinking about some kind of friendly amendment that is um, having not just talking about state priorities, but communicating with the mayor about his priorities and his, um, for the city, not at the state level. Mm -hmm. One of my frustrations consistently has been that um, we're not, the, the lines of communication between the council and the president and the, uh, the mayor haven't been um, robust enough for me. And I would like to know more about what he's working on and what he's thinking about. And so if the, and I'm just kind of floating uh, an idea here at this point, but if the sponsors would be open to expanding the language a little bit to say uh, a discussion about state legislative priorities and priorities for the city or the mayor's priorities, ideas for the city, something like that, so that we could actually codify a little bit the um, communication lines between us and the mayor. So those are my thoughts about these. Thank you. I, I should note, it sounds like that the will of the council is to refer this because there are many complex matters that are emerging. That's just my note. Any other discussion? Council Bidwell. Uh, I'll, I'll save the rest of it for, 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 for committee, but just as a, as a, as a response, Council Klein, I, 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 as one of the <coughs> I certainly welcome some, some, some modified language like that, but I'll further say and I was uh, discussing this earlier today with uh, Councillor O'Donnell. Uh, I agree that there are various areas where more robust conversation with, with, with the mayor, I think, would be welcome. One of those is, is in our budget process. And I will separately be recommending that we, we encourage early in our budget process just a more open-ended conversation, you know, before the 250 page document is laid on us um, just a conversation about priorities uh, and ideas we're hearing from our constituents that could work their way into the budget process so I think I think that's one of those areas where we, we really should encourage a little more conversation earlier in the process but that's another matter so what's the what's the will of the council with this matter would it be referral to legislative matters Okay, the motion is made. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion on the referral to legislative matters, Councilor Nash? I think it would make sense with a with this language that talks about referring stuff to committee that this actually should go to committee. We, we, should, we should model it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> Refer to the committee on irony and. <laughs> um, all right. Any other discussion on the referral? Uh, all those in favor of referrals, please say aye. 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 Those no. That order is referred. Um, one more order. This is um, 18.016, an order to amend the council rules relative to the Committee on Public Works and Utilities. Unless there's any objection, I'll rave a wave reading. Is there a motion on this or, uh, order? Uh, so move. move approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, <coughs> if I may, this is. The idea that I put forward as part of uh, the assignments that I made on Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> as I stated, uh, the Committee on Public Works and Utilities is sort of the successor to uh, another body that is sort of, was sort of defunct, and we tried this new approach for about two years. Um, I frankly think through no fault of our own, I think it just didn't work because it, it didn't meet and it hasn't met for almost 300 days. My concern is less that we need to somehow create agenda items to create busy work for a committee, which clearly has a, a smaller workload and scope in the post-division of powers era in, in Northampton, than it is that there be a standing committee with public works as part of its jurisdiction that citizens know they can go to, that it's, it's going to meet. I think of the Transportation and Parking Commission. It's not just things that are on the agenda. It's, you know, people know they can come and they can raise issues in public comment. And I think that's important. So what this order proposes uh, would be taking 
the elements of the Public Works and Utilities Committee, and you can see that they are bolded and underlined, and you can also see that there's not very much. And putting it into the City Services Committee um, on the theory that City Services and Public Works go well together, and my thinking was City Services has work in, the, in its committee, but maybe, it's, maybe the agendas of City Services are more like 90% full than 100% full, just from my experience on the committee. Um, but it's a judgment for the whole council to make um, about whether they want to do that. But to me, that makes sense. And then we'd have a committee that meet the city services is an active committee. So, Councilor uh, Carney. Yes, I appreciate the reasoning that um, you put into this, Councilor. Um, the only thing I would note is that the city services committee is an amalgamation already of four committees. It was appointments and evaluations. When I first came on, it had been the fire committee, which became public safety, which included then fire and police. Um, so uh, what became city services was the amalgamation of appointments, public safety, social services and veterans, veterans affairs, and um, senior center. Uh, that's part of social and services and veterans affairs. So, uh, I, I, and if for uh, in your experience, as you know, we dealt with. Uh, I'm not sure of the total number, but at least well over a hundred appointments in the in the last year. Probably a couple hundred in the last term. Mm -hmm. um, we have five on the, uh, you know, on the docket tonight. And um, I just, you know, I I think as we as we continue to push kind of, it becomes kind of the catch-all, this committee becomes the catch-all for most other, for most services, and, and, and certainly most things can be related to city services. So for city services, we'd now have the big three, police, fire, and, police, fire, and, and uh, public works, and then of course all the others that are listed, including the building department and the health department and all of the social, I mean, there's a lot of, I don't see that we would be able to meet the requirements of the, unless we were to consider then really ways of streamlining meeting with three departments at once on a regular basis, trying to figure out it would require some creative scheduling. <coughs> Um, the only thing that I can consider that I don't, I'm not suggesting at all, is to look at. Um, I mean, that could see, that could easily be the work of two committees, and I can understand why the Public Works and Utilities may not be its own, but if there were a committee that took care of the big three of Public Safety, Police, Fire, and Public Works, and then something else that took <coughs> care of Appointments, Social Services, and you know, all of those, uh, I'm, I'm just putting it out there. I don't object to the, uh, to the rule change per se. I just think that it um, could set us up for not being, it, especially if we're talking about referring, many items could end up referred to um, city services. I'm, I'm talking about uh, we've generally taken care of all of the major hires and appointments, senior, you know, senior center director, interim city clerk, all of those require a lot of dedicated uh, meeting time. So I just put it out there as saying that, I, you know, it's, it's, a he it, it's a big load for that committee. And, and you know, I, for example, legislative matters had been the uh, committee for appointments. Sure and arbitrarily it seemed to be taken out of legislative matters and given to the city services committee, which was public safety. But I have to say that the appointments is a, you know, is a big chunk of that, of that committee. So if you look at all of the committees and look at city services, I do think it's already, you may point to it, think of it as 90%, but it, yeah. it does feel like in order to meet the charge of the committee, it's a lot of work. And I appreciate that perspective. So, Councillor Dwight, Councillor Barge, and Councillor Pitt. The, um, a lot, uh, now, a large portion of uh, the responsibility of, of uh, particularly stuff related to departments and then we separate appointments are, are just simply presentations. We actually 
in under the new charter we really don't have too much authority over them other than budgetary so in the presentations in the past and I think it's because the it's part of the problem was we had legacy um, legacy procedures that weren't you know that we you know the the SS VHS at one point was another committee that became catch-all but it was basically a presentation forum there was no there were no orders that were coming out of it there were no votes that came out of it there were there was nothing uh, that ever really even got referred back to this floor and in a large portion of this for instance hearing from public safety hearing from the DPW and everything else does not get referred back to the body at large for deliberation and debate I mean the purpose is ultimately of the committees is is uh, referral points where we can get more granular as Councillor Nash referred to on issues that allow us to to vote and do our job with more clarity um, then there's the functionary part which is uh, you know researching and approving appointments and and I think to we're, we're, we're struggling with you know the DPW was a legacy problem um, there was there was when the Board of Public Works existed there was a liaison committee that actually at one point was proved to be quite helpful and fruitful because we actually had some authority but not as much as we actually now have for uh, setting uh, setting the water and sewer rates and the hope was here was that establishing this committee would allow the opportunity for the public uh, discussion and broader discourse and presentation of the, the sewer and water rates. Well, we did that, Councilor Bidwell did that. And then we realized, oh, wait a minute, there really isn't any much, we don't have much aegis over any other dimension of this department, not the way that we used to or some influence. And the concern was, the council getting more and more divorced from the departments and having less involvement and engagement and, and kind of giving up that authority we see. Uh, Councilor Carney's right. When I first came on, we had we had the police. <laughs> we had a separate committee for police, a separate committee for, committee for parking, a separate committee for fire. And there were at times when certain councilors not quite understanding the parameters of authority would treat them as police commissions or <coughs> fire commissions where we actually dictated policy and dictated performance and and also threatened employees among other things and interfered in collective bargaining and that yes. <laughs> that was not good that was bad but the fact is we felt that we still have to hold on to some kind of vestigial uh, um, connection and I think it's true. I think it's important for us in order to, I mean, our job is to try and be fairly fluent in at least the challenges facing each one of these departments as we start to work on budget priorities. All that said, I think that, that there's less need. I don't, I'm not sure about the need, and I haven't sat on the, uh, served on this committee, so I, I'm speaking complete ignorance, but less of a need to have presentations that could be probably dealt with with a memo, um, but maybe not. Maybe there is some intrinsic and real value that can be realized. But it, it, it is true, I think, that there's, there's a collection of stuff here that's just sort of been heaped on this committee that requires time but not much product other than the approval of appointments. And so I can appreciate Councilor Carney's frustration, but at the same time, I think that um, we, in maintaining these committees, we are maintaining just busy work that does not have any effective, real value to us as a as a committee, as a council. Thank you, Councilor. So, Councilor Car um, Labarge, you were next. I have the same concerns um, that Councilor Carney has. Um, I think when you're talking about the Board of Public Works and the infrastructure and being included in that with everything else that we know that has that we have a responsibility to do you were also Councillor O'Donnell on the committee too you saw how much was involved in that committee so I'm a little leery about adding the public works onto what we have already 
And I don't know which way we could go about solving that problem, but I think it's a little overwhelming. Okay, Councillor Bidwell. Um, two, two thoughts on this. One, as the, 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 the Chair of Public Works and Utilities, um, a, little, a little bit of background on the, on the fact that we have not met for a number of months. Um, there, we've, I've been in discussions with the mayor about tweaks to the stormwater ordinance and the credit policy. Um, and we all kind of decided that rather than take those up in the middle of a mayoral campaign and further entangle them in electoral politics, it would make a lot of sense to defer those to the start of the new session. So we, we intentionally have <coughs> not engaged in, 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 in some issues and, 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 and put them off. And similarly, uh, we've been asking uh, Director Lascali and the mayor to, to present a little more robust explanation of the methodology that determines paving priorities in the city. And that, too, was going to get tackled in the new year in this, in this committee. So some, some, of, some of these issues are, uh, they've been brewing and we've been preparing to, to, to tackle them at the start of the new year. And so it's sort of been intentional that they, we, we didn't talk about them in the last three or four months. Um, so so, so, so the, the activity before that committee for the last three or four months I don't believe is indicative of, 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 of the issues that are appropriately brought to that, that committee. Nonetheless, I, I do, I do um, I'm sympathetic to the, to the desire to, to combine them. And my, my second thought is that, like Councillor Dwight, um, I certainly am not attached to bringing in department heads for the sake of bringing in department heads. Uh, as a matter of fact, I thought one of the more fruitful conversations that we had in the City Services Committee uh, was when we decided we wanted to bring numerous uh, city officials and other officials for a more thematic conversation. Uh, the conversation we had about the op opioid crisis comes to mind, where we had emergency services, we had public health, we had Hampshire Hopes, we even had the DA's office in here. And it wasn't individual departments kind of just talking for the sake of we asked them to be here, but it was a really substantive interchange. And I, that would be my approach to how we uh, continue to be engaged with those departments, but, but around themes where we might have two or three or four all, all appear at the same time for, for, for conversation. So I, I, think, I think there's a way to make it work, but um, we should be aware that uh, we're, we're at it, we're, we're putting a lot on this committee if, if, if we do this consolidation. Thank you, Councilor Murphy. Um, I sort of recall that the Councilor Spector was very into this Public Works Committee in, in its day. And as I recall, the, the, the kind of the justification once the new charter came in and, and it was clear that uh, there was a pretty hard line between the departments and the legislative branch, the thing that, uh, that kind of allowed it to survive was its role on water and sewer rates. I mean, that was really the reason it lived. If it wasn't for that, it wouldn't have lived at all. Mm -hmm. And if, I mean, if, if, if that role got s sent to finance where every other financial thing goes and, and finance did the water and sewer rates like the rest of the budget stuff. And then, you know, and I agree with what you're saying because having, I, I was on city services when it was the obligatory presentation on EMS and, you know, we were busy when they were starting their ambulance service, but once it got up and running, which is sort of a monitoring thing, but as a place to refer something relative to DPW, but, but not imply that, you know, once a cycle you gotta have the DPW director in to do a presentation, but it's more where do you where would you refer something that you would have sent to the other committee? And clearly there was not a lot of stuff sent there in the last term. <laughs> um, the, if it's if something arises that needs to get referred somewhere of uh, that's of a city service nature, it would go there. But if if you send water sewer rates over to finance and say, hey, city services, it's not like you have to have these people in a rotation where you visit with them all the time, but if we have an issue we want to send somewhere 
to refer for an opinion, we'd send it there, but don't expect it to require you to have them in all the time for, for presentations that aren't action oriented. Um, in fact, you may want you, the committee want, may want to think that in general. Do we want to do the presentation thing or do we want to just be where, you know, where something gets referred if there's action required by the council, but it necessarily doesn't mean you have to, to make work and have them come in and, and do presentations unless there's an issue on the table. And then you have them in. Um, Councilor Dwight, unless, yeah, Councilor Dwight. Uh, to expand on that, we actually have the budget hearing process where most of those things, most of the items that even during the course of the presentations of the departments are covered again, they're rehashed for the purposes of, uh, of, of the budget analysis. I think, I think those are, and that's a separate program. That's actually set up that's not even necessarily done in committees, that that can be done as hearings, as a series of hearings. So to that extent, a, a significant portion of that. I mean, and I do understand the desire by the council too, because I do, my concern of course is getting too detached. The, I mean, this is the issue of trying to balance the separation of powers, becoming too detached. We, we don't have authority, we, we do have influence, and we also do, it's, it's incumbent upon us to at least have some understanding when we address these things in, in the budget or as we draft and create law that would impact and affect these various departments. So, as long as there's a venue for which they can gather at, as opposed to a mandatory show up, give us your dog and pony show, we'll, we'll, we'll waste your time, you'll waste ours, and we'll, and, 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 and we'll call it, we'll say we met. And that I, you know, that's always been my frustration with a lot of the committees that we've had sometimes. And I know I don't, I don't, I'm not alone in that. I'll just be the mo one who speaks most frankly about it, I think, in that case, because I, I have heard over the years that I was serving as president from a number of committee chairs that this is really kind of annoying. And it is time consuming and it has no real or substantive value. So I think that this actually forces us to reassess and think about what's the best, most efficacious way to conduct polity in a way that the committee structure affords us and take advantage of that and not just do it for the sake of doing it. Councilor Zegri, the old public safety committee. Yes. Yeah. and I flip-flopped chairs on that a couple of times. You know, we did a lot of good work, as I mentioned, when ambulance was gonna be taken over full-time by fire, our relationship with them over the two years that that was happening was really meaningful because we could bring their plan here we, we did a lot of work because there was something going on there. But on an ongoing basis, now that the program's up and running, it doesn't really need the oversight it needed. We didn't have the questions that we had when they were starting it. So, I mean, I think it's, it's to, up to that committee, kind of turn it up and turn it down, depending on what's going on, and be a place where referrals go when action is needed. But, you know, busy work and making a department had put together a PowerPoint to come in and say, status quo, you know, Maybe that's not the best use of everybody's time. So I think they shut the heat off. I don't know if you feel that. I think so. It's getting pretty cold. Are you cold? Uh, and, and so, what's the council's uh, will or, or pleasure for this board to? Do you want to vote on, or do you want to refer it to legislative matters for more discussion? Yeah. I'm prepared to vote for it now. I mean, you know, but. Well. Yeah, as the author, I'm going to suggest uh, we refer it because it sounds like um, there's still some things to hash out and Councillor Murphy brings up an idea about finance handling hearings, for example, and that's mm -hmm. a worthy yeah, counter suggestion. Really, there had to be a venue for a public hearing on water sewer rates and so it was DPW, yeah. but it could just as easily be finance. Makes sense to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, and I take Councillor Carney's um, opinions uh, quite seriously as the chair of the committee. so. That's, I'm making a motion to refer to legislative matters. Is there a oh, second? Second. Second by Councilor uh, Dwight. Any discussion on the referral? Um, if not, all those Should discussion we consider on also referring it to city, city services? Sir. So I that they could maybe discuss? The, I think that's too much, personally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeez. <laughs> then we really are in it. That, that <laughs> is the <laughs> referral of irony. <laughs> 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 
Then we'll wind up looking at back of grown heads or something. <laughs> um, I think that is a, an ironic <laughs> No other discussion on the question of the referral? Uh, if not, all those in favor of the referral, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. So, uh, the item is referred. Any new business for the evening? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Any opposed to adjournment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you.